Recording in progress. Okay, there we go, the magic words. And we give a very warm welcome to everyone who's joined us for our afternoon council meeting. And we're glad you're with us. And for those of you who watch this later on on our website, I hope you enjoy that as well. And we look forward to everyone's participation. Before we begin, we are continuing our hybrid method of meeting. So I'm gonna turn it right over to our amazing city clerk, uh, Clementine, who will explain how people can participate in the meeting. It's all yours. Thanks. The city of Monterey is committed to the safe attendance of its public meetings. Masks are strongly recommended for all who attend in person, regardless of vaccination status, except those who are younger than two years old or have a medical condition that prevents wearing a mask. Attendees in the council chamber, please keep your phones and devices muted to prevent audio interference. And there are two ways to virtually participate in today's meeting. You may join us using the Zoom app on your computer or mobile device, and you can also call into the Zoom meeting. To join the meeting on Zoom on your computer, smartphone, or telephone, use the link or phone number on the agenda at iSearchMonterey.org. An up-to-date version of the Zoom software must be used. To call in by telephone, dial toll-free 833-568-8864 and enter meeting ID 160-772-9333, pound. And if prompted to enter a participant ID, press pound. Detailed instructions on using and updating Zoom are available at monterey.org slash public meetings. To make a public comment using the Zoom app, you can virtually raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. If you dialed in by phone, raise your hand by dialing star nine and then unmute yourself when called upon by dialing star six. You must do both. Public commenters will be muted until it is their turn to speak. I'll call on each public speaker in the order of their hands raised. Please stay within the time limit established for today's meeting and a countdown timer will be shown on the screen. If you're connected live with us on Zoom, the timer is accurate with no delay. Today's meeting is also streamed live on the city's YouTube account at youtube.com slash city of Monterey with about 10 seconds delay and on Comcast channel 25 up to 90 seconds delay. And we look forward to receiving your public comments. Oh, very good, thanks so much. And would you do one more thing? I'll call the meeting to okay. order and would you introduce your caring city council, please? Yes, council member Albert. Here. Council member Hoffa. Here. Council member Smith. Here. Councilmember Williamson. Here. And Mayor Roberson. Here as well. Thank you for that. So let's just uh, go right ahead and get started on our agenda because we do have a lot of closed session this afternoon as well. So the first thing we do is to receive a presentation regarding the status of the waterfront parking lot resurface and stripe project phase two. As we know, the city recently completed the parking lot phase one and it turned out amazingly well, very environmental, uh, very user friendly. So we're looking at uh, continuing along those same lines. Without further ado, let's hear from our inspiring uh, city manager, Hans Uslar, who can introduce the staff. Thank you. Mr. City, um, Mr. Mayor, I appreciate uh, the word inspiring. I hope we say this at 2200 tonight as well. <laughs> With that, um, I it probably will, but maybe a few more wonderful adjectives. With I, starting with I, uh, we, uh, <laughs> uh, our public works director will present to you, and I encourage you to ask him a lot of questions because you will not hear a lot more presentations from him coming. One more, he says. So, but that's right. Pepper him with questions. Uh, ask, <laughs> ask him specifically of the location of the pay stations next to the Surfside building. I think he will be happy to answer that as well. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Thank you, Hans, with that uh, inspiring uh, in, in introduction. Um, Mayor, members of council, what we wanted to do was bring this item back for your uh, uh, consideration or actually for your update. About a year ago, the uh, staff brought uh, forward the uh, um, plans for our, what we're looking for phase two of our, our parking situation at the um, waterfront lot, as you uh, may be aware, but for the community, uh, we're in the process of upgrading the parking and visitor accommodations uh, uh, for the waterfront areas for, between the wars. Um, uh, basically the effort that we're doing out there is, is three phases. The first phase, as you mentioned, is completed. Uh, the phase two is what we're talking about tonight. And the third phase, uh, the third phase will improve the area adjacent to the dry boat storage uh, north of Figueroa Street. 
that only one is scheduled for implementation in 2024, assuming the revenues catch up with where, where our plans want to be. So here's a visual where we're talking about the marina lot as we're, as we're calling it is the area between Washington and Figueroa. Oh, Washington and Figueroa. Um, and basically we've came about a year ago, like I mentioned with the, with the planning design. Uh, since that point in time, we've actually, um, you know, there's a layout for the lot, one more. Uh, this was what we pre presented about a year ago uh, in June of 2021. Uh, maximizing parking and continuing a, 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 a gated entry type facility, which required three exit lanes near the bottom of the picture. What you'll see there is are three arrows that are pointing to the right of the screen, just above the word bioretention. Those three arrows represented gated exiting facilities. Um, as a result of um, community meetings, uh, communications with the um, Coastal Commission, uh, stakeholder input, uh, we've taken the opportunity to redesign the lot a little bit slide, uh, to the new uh, revised layout of the marina lot. What you'll note is that the exit gates have been removed um, and there's a little more room and space for the recreation trail, which is just above those, those uh, black arrows or the white arrows from the previous slide. Um, this was done basically to make the lot safer, to make it more inviting. Um, and actually, as a result of uh, improved um, ability to monitor the lot, it was also one of the things that we had gotten from uh, feedback from our, our parking um, customers and from the, the Wharf Association and different uh, business holders out there that they were seeing some congestion happening when boats would come in from uh, salmon fishing or from uh, whale watching tours and be a lot of congestion associated with exiting the lot. Um, additionally, there are some challenges that we have based upon the traffic at Figueroa and Del Monte that causes a backup that goes all the way back into the parking facility. Uh, that backup would actually impact the gate operation for exiting the lot. Um, taking that into consideration and looking at what we were trying to achieve in the area for customer service and parking, what we wanted to do always was create a unifying pro uh, experience for customers. And what we decided to do or looked at the feasibility of doing was actually removing the lots and instead of having this area uh, be a, a gated facility, have the entire lot be a pay by space facility. Um, we went, we ran through some simulations, we talked with various consultants and with technology that uh, uh, we believe uh, will help us uh, with our um, uh, work through this process. We believe it's doable uh, into the future where we're confident uh, in this design change. So like I say, just a, a quick recap, what this does for us is it allows us to reduce the impervious footprint of the paved area. By reducing from three exit lanes to basically two exit lanes, we have additional area where water can be taken, stormwater can be taken for uh, improved runoff and, and treated prior to release into the, um, into the bay. As, as the mayor pointed out in phase one, we were successful in implementing a stormwater uh, pollution prevention um, structure structures within phase one of the parking facility. This lot will do the same thing and stormwater that comes off of that uh, parking facility will go through two uh, bio filters before it exits into the bay. So we'll remove those, um, those greases and rust and other things that eventually just fall off of cars uh, as they're parked. So we're improving the environmental um, components of that parking lot as well. And like I mentioned before, we're going to eliminate the uh, the pinch point at it from a gated exit. Uh, the recreation trail is also going to be wider than it was originally designed, which is actually wider than it currently is. And we're providing it with enhanced lighting for more safety uh, for the users on that particular uh, avenue as it's very popular going through the marina parking lot. Um, and it, the, the key thing to this is, is that we're eliminating the multi-lane vehicle conflict point at Figueroa Street. And, and what that means in layman's terms is that right now we have a rec trail crosses two lanes of traffic uh, that are exiting off of the wharf um, or the parking area. And we're moving the, re the recreation trail so that's no longer in conflict with that large exiting volume. So the revisions include, like we say, uh, the removal of the gates, both at the entrance and the exit, those will be removed and in place, we'll have uh, solar payment kiosks that'll be located in, in convenient location, locations throughout the, uh, the parking lot. Because they are solar powered, 
very little infrastructure is required to actually put those into operation. And we, we have initially planned the deployment of, I believe, no, in a lot. So we, we, have, we have 28 going out throughout the city, but in this particular lot, I believe we have six, six to 10. <laughs> well, we're going to have sufficient of, of, the, of the kiosks so that they're convenient to um, to the to the customers. And one of the things that we have found to be successful within our parking program is the implementation of the ability of um, parkers to use smartphone technology to pay for their their parking fees. Um, this is something that council approved a couple of years ago and has become exceedingly popular and exceedingly successful here in Monterey. It allows uh, individuals to extend their parking operations time or parking stay time by simply tapping into their uh, app on their cell phone. Um, it's become wonderfully um, successful. Like I say, there are folks out there who can still pay by cash or can still use a credit card, but the vast majority of our, of our users really appreciate the, the convenience of a, a pay by app um, system. And then this is the relocation of the rec trail. So as you see on the top picture, the, the area in green is the current rec trail and it crosses those two lanes of traffic as it's exiting out of the, uh, the wharf area. The new uh, revised alignment is the area in blue. You can see it's much wider and it actually avoids that multi-lane exiting coming out of uh, Figueroa right there. Um, it'll be lighted um, and the, the dotted Areas that are on both sides of the blue are actually landscaping and landscape features. So it'll actually uh, be a little bit more enhanced from the, the current um, look that we have out there today. So in essence, like I mentioned, we just wanted to give council an update. We're looking at uh, finalizing the plans for this project um, and we're going to hopefully be under construction in winter of 2022. So only a few months. Uh, but like I said, I wanted to give you an update because it has changed a little bit since the last time we brought this project uh, before you. So with that, so any questions, we have to answer. I have Christy Steffi, who's our parking superintendent, who can answer any questions as well. You're muted. Wow. Yeah, okay, that's a, a very good report from our illuminating public, illuminating public works director. You can take that with you to your next uh, gig. So I have a couple of questions, uh, if I may, and, and both have to do with uh, wheelchair access. And are we gonna be looking for more integration between the first waterfront project, which we have finished and also the second one. And my second question also has to do with that. Currently, if, if uh, someone's in a wheelchair going from Sapporo's or the the pub there london pub etc to get on the from that parking lot onto the rec trail you there is actually no sidewalk and no real easy access right now to get from if you're in the wharf two area onto the rec trail so will those two areas be corrected in our upcoming project so the, the first question is, once this project is completed, it will look like a unified lot. You will not know that there is okay. an ending and there's a marine lot beginning. It will be one unified lot. Um, the route of transportation from Sapporo's or those, those restaurants out there will be either you can come back to the wharf itself and come forward towards the rec trail on Figueroa, or mm -hmm. you can walk along the waterfront and we're installing a, a, a new part of the process, a, a new crosswalk installing across the, the boat ramp, the boat launch, which will bring yes. you to a path where you can connect to the, I'm calling it the, the, the pathway through the middle of the current waterfront lot. So I think we took the pictures off, but essentially you'll, you'll have two paths of travel, whether you're going towards the um, brew pub, uh, the, um, uh, the, the brewery towards uh, Del Monte, or if you're going towards the waterfront and, and to the wharf, you can go either direction via wheelchair. Excellent, thank you. Answers my questions. Other council questions? Council member Dan, then we'll go to council member Ed. Dan, unmute. Um, thank you, yes, um, it took me a second there. Um, yeah. Steve, can you put that back on? Um, could you put the, the plan back on again, real quickly? The map, whatever it is. We're, we're trying. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hang on a second. 
You like a little song or dance while we're doing this thing? <laughs> it's, it's the one. Light. Yeah, that's that's the um, well. It's the proposed. Is that the proposed? That one. Okay, um, I I can't see it very well because it's not in actual. It's not large enough for me to look at again. Yeah, can you just go to just go to the show show slides? We're sharing the wrong screen. I apologize. One moment. Yeah. And see, the thought was to be in the council chambers to avoid any kind of issues. <laughs> there, beautiful. Thank you. Excellent. So, uh, my question is: Is the only uh, egress that's mean that means going out of the parking lot, right? Yeah, egress. Is it only across the um, from the parking lot? Is it only across the the rec trail? Is that the only egress from that parking lot? So essentially. The answer. Oh, is that on the left side? Is, are those egresses there getting out? So one is an entry and one is an egress, but that also crosses the rec trail because the rec trail goes along the perimeter of the waterfront lot as well. So technically we're across, we have to cross the rec trail at some point. Right. Uh, but, the, but we are planning to have an egress out on Washington Street as well that will allow right turns only. Yeah, is that the, the, the cross lines on the left side of the parking lot? You can so, get out that way? Yeah, the cross lines on the, the the densely close together cross lines represent crosswalks. Okay, I get it. So those are egress also. I, I thought when I looked at it close enough, it looked like the only egress was across the rec trail. But now I see the egress on the on the left uh, side of the parking lot. I get that. Um, can uh, is the are, that turning radius is that is that big enough for boats to turn? So the idea for boats, backing up, the, the turning radius for boats um, has actually been calculated and looked at and, and it is big enough for okay. boats, it is. But the actual idea is the slanted parking stalls that are located in the middle of the drawing uh -huh. would be where the boats would primarily park. I see. So what they do is they would come in at the uh, the ingress, which is closer to the to the uh, Sapporos and, and whatnot, is the intended ingress uh, to the lot. They would come down that that track with their boat. They could launch the facility. There's a little holding area, that hatched area. There's a little holding area where you could prep your boat, get it prepared, get your documents, whatever you needed to do, uh, get your boat prepped up. And then what you would do is you would queue up to uh, launch your boat. You would launch your boat and then park your trailer and boat into one of those those slotted uh, those angled um parking stalls um and they're they're that way they're drawn that way but really they're intended to be double length so that they uh, could accommodate a boat and trailer to be parked there and then what you would do is to pick up your your boat you would actually pull back around that same way and uh you know get your boat and, and leave the lot okay uh, my only question was uh, i thought that the egress was just across the, the recreation trail but now that i see that it's at the end of the lot um i have no more questions thanks yeah. and, and just right. great, great questions go ahead steve for total clarification there's an ingress and an egress at washington both of those things are not egress at washington there's an ingress as well um there's two egresses at at figaro okay great thank you thank you council member ed you had a question yeah steve uh, while the map is up there uh it looks as though that as you come in on figaro we're creating a small island so because we have commercial trucks that when many of us are sleeping in the middle of the night the uh, trucks are backing down to offload squid so the placement of that island i'm assuming the space is adequate for the trucks to go in and out and get down to the end of the wharf so that uh, that island that you see is actually just paint okay good the, all the even better even there. better it just paint great that's super uh the other thing is i like the uh, reconfigured uh entry from the rec trail because it puts it at a position that improves the safety i i like that um the the other thing is because we're getting more and more dependent on visitors to use an app um to be able to access if that there's a couple different choices i know the easiest probably as fastest is push your card in there and you know do your time. But as we get more folks that are coming more frequently and they do want to download the app, how's the Wi-Fi in the area? Because to get to the app and download that, you have to have a pretty good, pretty adequate Wi-Fi somewhere. 
Um, don't need to necessarily, you know, deep dive on this, but just as we go forward in the projects, as we have our parking lots where people are trying to access, um, we want to consider what's the capacity of our Wi-Fi in the parking lots. It, it makes total sense, and, and we have not seen a problem uh, to date, and we'll continue to monitor that as, as we expand the use of this, but so far so good, as we'll say, but we'll, we'll continue to monitor if there's any kind of complaints of delays or access issues with these uh, automated type systems. Great, and, and I know we'll have an opportunity for signage that's on the actual uh, machine itself. If somebody's you know, traveling from uh, you know, European location, they, they don't have the roaming that they might need, but if they're able to uh, get instructions about how to access our harbor, harbor as a guest for Wi-Fi, that would be helpful. So more more signage for that. Um, and that's all I have, Mayor. Oh, excellent. Uh, any more questions before we get public input? I have a few questions, Mayor. Okay, Council Member Tyler, please. So um, while you have the slides up here, um, sorry, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Yeah, getting some feedback. So yeah. I, I'm just, yeah, so I'm just wondering, um, I guess I'm having a little bit of trouble understanding um, the safety increases for the rec trail. I understand the traffic backup, but it looks like we're going from having one place where the rec trail would cross traffic to now having three places where the rec trail could potentially interact with traffic. Am I seeing that correctly? So on, on uh, you are seeing that there's three places where we're crossing the rec trail. That is that is true. Um, the previous location, however, was was actually more dangerous, uh, primarily because of the multi-lane threat. Um, there are some slides that I can show if you if you'd like, but really what we have is a situation where these new crossings that we're talking about here are raised elevation crossings, and they're going to be well lit to actually identify that there's I call it a speed hump, if you will, for for the vehicles who are coming out of there. Right now, it's you're on a, on a plane level with. Uh, uh, pedestrians and bicyclists uh, as they're traveling the road on uh, exiting Figueroa. Um, what we're seeing is with the current location of the rec trail, as individuals are leaving the lot and they're trying to catch the light at Figueroa, they may come through there focused on the light and not focused on pedestrians coming from the left or from the right of their vehicle. Um, the location that we have up here it is subject to less volume of traffic coming out at one particular time. There will be volume coming off of the wharf, certainly. There will be volume coming out of that that crosswalk area halfway through the uh, parking lot, and there will be volume at the other, uh, the left side as well. But it'll be individualized and split up as opposed to every single car that's leaving that facility needing to go through those two lanes. So by breaking up the pattern, breaking up the queuing of the cars that are leaving, there'll be less individual chances for conflict across those individual lanes and with the additional with the additional lighting for evening um, and the additional speed hump if you will um, it will result in a, in a safer crossing okay no that helps I, I think having the speed bump I think helps and, and I understand regarding the traffic and folks trying to rush to the speed light and trying to make that so I appreciate the response there um, and, and and maybe at a future presentation helpful to see what that might look like. I don't think it's necessary for today, but just kind of having that visually available for folks I think might be helpful. Um, and then for the the pay for parking, so is my understanding around that correct to say that for that model to occur, we would also have to have um, parking monitors checking the parking, like circulating the parking lot to ensure that folks are actually paying for the parking spaces and and then is that also associated with like a cost benefit analysis in regards to the benefit of of, of having that alternative model yeah so we've actually looked at how the enforcement of this lot would actually work and we believe that that there there will be some additional enforcement one of the things that we're balancing with this so let me back up a little bit you're absolutely correct the pay by space will will require officers to enforce that and if there's someone has a violation they will be cited uh, so that will require an officer to do that one of the one of the things that we had uh, received as, as part of our comments and i'm sure that the council has seen this as well is is when we 
lost our, our um, staffing in the lot. There was some concern about um, safety with not a manned lot, not someone in the lot looking around places or, or if there was a question. Um, with patrol out there looking at these various lots now and operating in the same fashion, there'll be a little bit more presence out there from parking staff. It won't be the parking services representatives per se, but it, it would be enforcement that could help out. And with the flashing vehicles that they have, the you know the three wheel scooters that have the flashes on top, they're easily recognizable to anybody who is lost or concerned, but it would be a little bit more presence by officers, but during the, the cost analysis of how much staffing we anticipate that we'll have actually reduction of staffing um, requirement with this with this model okay i think something like that in, in a future presentation i think just looking at those numbers might fool too so i um i i i trust what you're saying i just think it's helpful visually to see that as part of the presentation and then the last thing is could there be an opportunity as opposed to having the biofilters and allowing the stormwater runoff to go out into the bay, could we um, shift that direction and put it in the manhole for modern one water to use that as part of the recycled water project? You, you must be reading minds of things that are going on in future plans because that's exactly what we're planning on doing. So if you look at the area that's hatched or it's kind of speckled, I wish I had a laser pointer that you could see between the uh, the brew pub parking lots and the exit lanes of the cursor, right? To left hand is <laughs> I believe in you. So this oh, yeah. area, yep. uh, that will be where the uh, biofiltration will go. Um, different items coming towards council at a, at a future time, you will see requests for um, uh, approving contracts and, and different um, consultants to perform environmental evaluations to allow the direct transfer of stormwater into, um, into the uh, Monterey One system. So that's well on our, on our horizon, we're, we're trying to do that, but you know, as, as we're going through processes is, is one thing's a little ahead of us, something else. We just wanna make sure we don't paint ourselves in a corner. We wanna get progress happening, allow that to come forward. And that is squarely in our horizon is trying to figure out how to actually repurpose that water ultimately. So not just clean it, but actually reuse it through Monterey One. So that is something that is definitely on, on the plan. Um, and it's definitely something that we will be exploring to, uh, to prove feasibility for it. All right, I appreciate the response to all the questions. We'll miss you, Steve. I know you're not gone yet, but we'll miss Thank you now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anything, Alan? No questions. Appreciate the presentation. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Councilmember Allen. Uh, do we have any public comment on this from anyone in the council chambers? Uh, no one here in the council chambers, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And any comments uh, online? Yes, we do. Um, first, we'll have a caller whose last three digits are 500. Please unmute yourself. Okay, go ahead, please. I'm unmuted. Thank you. This is Wendy Brickman, and I'm excited about being able to pay for the parking on my phone. So that sounds like a great improvement. Looking at that map, Steve, um, did we go from three exits to one from the waterfront lot proper? So essentially what you do is, is, is it reduces the number of lanes because there's no queuing at any kind of a gate or pay station. So yeah, it is reduced, but you, you but the, the, the reason why it was wider was to accommodate the gates and to reduce queuing. Without queuing expected to happen, we should be good to go. Okay, and it looks like you can either turn right on what, Washington or something, or, or right on Figueroa. I'm not looking at the map anymore, but is that correct? A right turn from Washington. You have two. Yes. Do you have two exits. Yes. Okay. The other thing is, uh, will you be removing any parking spaces? Unfortunately, I think we're probably going to lose like one space with the reconfiguration. Okay. That's not bad. Well, it looks exciting, and and I'm glad you're starting it in winter rather than fall which is a less busy time around the waterfront. But thank you. Thank you, Wendy. 
All right, next we have um, M. Becker. M. Becker, please go ahead. Uh, Mike Becker speaking, Canada Grow Company or uh, Surfside Enterprise. Uh, good afternoon, Council, Mayor. Appreciate this presentation and excellent job that Steve has uh, put together. I just have a couple of quick questions um, and uh, they, they have been great to work with in terms of uh, input and uh, back and forth. So my first question is with a tractor or a large beer truck uh, getting to be 45 to 53 feet long parked next to Surfside pointed toward wharf number one, what would be the exit strategy for that truck to, besides backing up, is that first left turn the radius going to be sufficient that's my first question and then the second question i have is in the uh, area as you enter figueroa before you get to the wharf there's a large cypress tree with two i believe pad mounted transformers and i think power is supplied to the lot and possibly surf side are those are those remaining or being removed those are my questions thank you very much thank you michael Probably should have, uh, before I answered Wendy's question, I should have asked if I wanted to answer them all now or whatever. I'm, I'm happy to answer either way, uh, Mr. Merrick. Yeah, why don't you save, save your answers and we'll get all the public questions at one time. Thank you, Steve, for asking. All right, we do have another telephone caller with the last three digits, 358. So telephone caller, please go ahead. Yes, um, my question is, um, you know, we're paving the world, and uh, I'm wondering if your pavement process is going to allow rain to help the groundwater issue that we have. Okay, we'll get that answer for you, Lorna. Thank you. Stay tuned. And no further commenters, Mr. Mayor. Good. Thank you. We'll close that the public comment section and get back to Steve. Steve, you had two or three questions, I think, to answer, please. Yeah, no problem. So uh, regards to uh, Mr. Becker's question, the, the trees uh, that are there, the, the um, um, and the transformers that are located beneath them, um, we're according to the design with PG&E to make sure it's it's going to function for what we need to do. Uh, they will move slightly, but uh, so there would be a slight alteration to power as they are re-energized. Um, what op what op what often happens is when projects like this go forward, PG&E uses that time to upgrade their infrastructure at the same time. So it's a situation where we coordinate heavily with PG&E, they'll upgrade their infrastructure. They'll we will work closely with the tenants out there to ensure we minimize their um, um, lack of power out of power with the process uh, to me is as minimal as possible, but those transformers will move slightly uh, and more than likely be replaced. Um, the beer trucks uh, that are delivered there, they will actually um, preferably enter the same way the boats exit the boat, same way the boats trailers will as circling through the area near the, um, the wharf entrance. So they'll, come around and they'll circle through and exit in one fell swoop. They might have to drive an, an extra 50 feet or so, but they will uh, be much more convenient for them to drive the same way that we expect the trailers with the boats to be, be hauled out. So we anticipate minimal um, issues with those uh, beer trucks. Um, the rain gutter and rain issues that are coming through, I think that we alluded to that a little bit, and I apologize because sometimes we get so involved in these projects, we forget that there's some folks out there who are not fully aware of what's going on. What we're actually trying to do with this process is, is one, eliminate our current situation where we have groundwater, pardon me, stormwater that is simply washing off the lot and going to the bay. That's what's currently happening right now. It's a bad situation. We're trying to correct it. That's one of the goals for this whole project. So what we're doing right now is we're capturing all that rainwater that form that we just go straight into the bay with the oils and grease and so forth. And we're running it through what we're calling tree filter boxes. And these boxes are filled with a media that's designed to remove those contaminants, filter it, if you will, and wash it prior to being um, exited into the bay or, or discharged into the bay. What Councilman uh, Williamson mentioned was a future project that we're working with Monterey One Water to actually recapture that water and have it processed by Monterey One Water for reuse as reclaimed water in the Monterey Peninsula. 
Right now, we are not having efforts to actually recharge water at that particular location so close to the waterway. There's not a lot of opportunity to water recharge at that location. However, by in, in, installing the stormwater features with a protective bay in the near term and having the door open for a longer term connection to Monterey One, we think it's the most responsible way to develop the, uh, the stormwater and, and to contain that aspect of it. So I think that got the questions. I think that was it. Uh, once again, bon voyage. Thank you very much for everything you've done from us, for us, from us. <laughs> you've tolerated from us. <laughs> Slip of the tongue. But you, you're just absolutely awesome. We appreciate you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes. Okay. Uh, exciting project, huh, folks? All right. Public comments allows the public to speak up to three minutes on any subject within the jurisdiction of the Monterey City Council and not on the agenda. I know we've had a lot of input on the uh, evening session with respect to the budget. I'll ask everyone to speak at that time with respect to the budget. So meanwhile, if you do have a general public comment and you want us to get back to us, we, the staff is excellent about responding and you can also reach the city at suggest at monterey.org, suggest at monterey.org. With that, general public comments not on the agenda. Anyone Any, in the chambers? No one here in the city council chambers. All right, and then online? Yes, we do. Um, and Jean-Rico Carr, uh, please go ahead. Hello. Before stepping foot in Monterey, I studied California corporate codes, California health and safety codes, the attorney general at that time, Jerry Brown's guidelines for medical cannabis, as well as the legal source for California cooperatives. The operations of my caregiver cooperative were compliant with all state laws and regulations. Both the Superior Court and the Court of Appeals refused to address the operations and ruled purely on the city's power to use moratoria. But was that moratorium legal? The city manager and the attorney was ne neglectful in adopting that moratorium in direct violation of government code section 65858. The city manager the city's first moratorium medical cannabis dispensaries back in 1997, and then in 19 extended it for the maximum 22 months and 15 days. Then that same city manager, city attorney in 2010, hid material facts from the elected city council members, the superior court and the appellate court with the malicious intent to deprive me of my due, of, of my due process. My right to protect my, my right to California Health and Safety Code 11362.5 and my right to the freedom of association. For the sake of time, let's put that aside for now and instead look at the current situation. The city has a copy of the appeal form I filed and a letter I received stating that my appeal would be held in abeyance until the city allows for. Technically, the city had a professional duty to address my appeal back when it was filed since I did comply with the city's 10-day deadline to file, but it's becoming clear the city is focused on oppositional defiance and is now just using to address my due process. The city could not have mitigated its damages towards me by addressing my appeal to the planning department, but no longer, but, but the longer the city waits, the more damage is being done. Our appeal to the planning depar department provides proof as to, leg to the legality of my caregiver's operations anywhere in the city of Monterey. My appeal to the planning department has not been resolved and the city's discrimination towards me is ongoing. The fact that it takes a white wealthy capitalist to buy and build out property to get the city to even entertain the notion of medical of cannabis when the city was towards an African-American medical cannabis advocate for establishing a cooperative with a group of under for a group of underserved Californians speaks volumes. I'm looking to the current elected officials to to protect this city's integrity and honor my due process. Thank you for your your time. All right, thank you. And next we have a telephone caller with the last three digits three five eight. Telephone caller last three digits three five eight. Please go ahead. 
Yes, um, good, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. Um, I wish to bring to your attention that gift card fraud is rampant, and it is something all corporations are partaking in. I recently lost $1,200 from purchasing eBay cards through a Rite Aid store on Alvarado Street. These cards are not guaranteed and are subject to hackers who post fictitious sites online, almost identical to the corporation that sells these cards, and then takes the codes over the phone. eBay actually can trace these codes to the fraud maker, but chose not to with me. eBay, is, eBay sells tractors with these cards to no loss of their own if fraud takes place. No one is accountable. I contacted Congressman Tanetta about this with a very reasonable solution. Make gift card corporations guarantee their cards. This can and should be done. If credit cards can do it, so can gift cards do it, as they are also a form of credit. His latest legislative aide told me that it was not possible solution as it would end all gift cards. We'll end them then. If corporations reaping millions from these cards can't guarantee their worth, they shouldn't sell them. Since when has the government become so lenient towards fraudulent selling practices, and when does it end? The solution is a simple one. Any corporation wanting to sell gift cards must guarantee their worth like credit cards do. And why is this so impossible? The greatness of our nation depends on politicians with enough backbone to stand up to cor cor corruption in all forms. And this form is a big one, becoming more pervasive in other transactions as well, such as money grams. I contacted, as I said before, Congressman Panetta, but he is doing nothing about it. So what I do as a citizen is warn all my fellow citizens, please do not buy gift cards and contact Congressman Panetta. Thank you. Thank you, Lorna. And I do not have anyone else with their hands raised on Zoom. All right, we will close the public comment section and go right ahead into our consent agenda. Did we have anyone in the public who wanted to pull anything from the consent? Not in the chambers, Mr. Mayor. All right, online, we haven't previously heard. Um, I don't see any hands at the moment. I saw Lorna's go up super briefly right after she spoke. So I don't, I don't think so though, because it didn't. And we haven't been informed that any items should be pulled, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, usually uh, the public is uh, so, so proficient and efficient in doing that ahead of time, and we always appreciate it. Any council members want to pull anything or have questions on the consent? Yeah, I just have a question at number eight. Yes, please go ahead, Council Member Tyler. So, so just for reference for the public, number eight is the uh, purchase for four uh, Ford, Ford police SUVs interceptors. Um, and I'm wondering if there's been a look at um, the purchase of electric vehicles as alternatives. Yeah, I've asked the same question of uh, our inspiring city manager, and he has an answer for you. Yeah, I, yep, I'm happy. To, uh, this is Nat Roach Nostadera, assistant city manager. Uh, we have looked into other vehicles at this time. There are uh, no other alternatives. Uh, Tesla, the city of Seaside, for example, purchased a number of Teslas, but they do not have the uh, the light bars and other accessories that uh, meet the police department needs. Uh, a number of years ago, Seaside purchased Teslas and they've been sitting in the parking lot for a few years until uh, they're able to be equipped. So we're not able to uh, to purchase electric vehicle police vehicles at this time, but uh, are looking at that in the horizon as new manufacturers come out with SUV electric vehicles. What is the requirement um, this the with the new state law? When, when does that get initiated for the requirement for us to start purchasing any new vehicles? The state law basically says uh, that they are not selling uh, gas powered vehicles by 2030 or 2030, 2035. 2035. Right. There, wasn't there a separate legislation in regards to uh, um, public agencies purchasing vehicles? Or is that is that just in alignment with what you were saying? 
uh, I'm not aware of any uh, separate legislation. There is uh, separate legislation with respect to diesel powered vehicles to 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 phase those out, but um, not anything with that. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's it, Mayor. Um, I and if there's nothing else, I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Uh, second. And if I can make it just a brief comment on the electric vehicles, I know we're starting to see some SUV electric vehicles, and that's basically what a police car is. And there's been a little controversy too with the United States government, uh, the post office purchasing gas powered vehicles when they have millions of vehicles. And if there is ever an opportunity to go electric, that certainly is. And I don't know, I think that's still under discussion. So thanks for bringing that up, Council Member Tyler. A roll call, please. Yes, Councilmember Williamson. Yes. Councilmember Hoffa. Yes. Councilmember Smith. Yes. Councilmember Albert. Yes. And Mayor Overson. Yes, that passes unanimously. So let's go to our public hearing. The first public hearing is to levy assessments to fund the North Fremont New Monterey and County Rural Business Improvement Districts, otherwise known as BIDs. And it's my understanding that we do assess these and then we will subsequently have a public hearing, a protest hearing, which is the opportunity for people to vote no on, on these assessment districts, which hasn't happened because they've been really very successful. So with that, Hans, any uh, introduction that you'd like to make on that before we go ahead and open it to the public? Yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, this is a standard item that we bring forward annually. It um, will be presented by our Community Development Director, Kim Ko. Excellent. Um, thank you, City Council. Um, I think many of you are very familiar with the annual levy of assessment, and I have two or three slides to share with you the process. Um, state law establishes the process and allows businesses to self-assess themselves to achieve their own business district goals. There's a two-step process that's enabled in state law. Um, the first process um, or the first step is the city council on May 17th approved each district's advisory report the annual report and set the public hearing date to levy the assessment. And that's the purpose of tonight's public hearing is to accept protests. Oh, okay. Um, just, I have one slide on each business improvement district and their proposed goals. Um, these were actually presented at the last meeting um, in your staff report. For the Cannery Row Business Improvement District, their BID assessment brings in about $130,000 annually. They have a remaining balance of about $94,000 in their account and total available funds to the BID is around $224,000. Their proposed projects um, will be a, encompass approximately $189,000. And you'll, you'll note that the, each business district is very unique and that's because each business district is, uh, establishes their own assessment rate. Um, the business improvement district for the Lighthouse area, um, their business assessment, um, I'm sorry, it looks like I didn't um, update that a prop properly. The BID assessment is $10,000 and they have no balance forward. So what they're going to be focusing on is prop, um, primarily web design and maintenance at $8,400 and their insurance costs. So their total budget for their business improvement district is $10,000. For the um, um, North Fremont business improvement district, um, it's around $57,000, their total expenditures and that's what I did. I put this back here. Their BID assessment is anticipated at 18,000. Their balance forward is just under 30,000 and they have a savings reserve of $93,000. So total funds available for the North Fremont Business District is right under $100,000. So I just wanted to present this this evening. Okay. Um, they're proposing or your action tonight is if you so desire is to levy the assessment for the 2021-2022 fiscal year for the um, following mm -hmm. BIDs 
and um, it's really a protest hearing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I thank you for that update on that. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you: the in the, the city general fund makes contributions to these three business districts. So historically, um, as part of the budget process, the city council is considered contributions to the business improvement districts, and I know you'll be um, talking about that this evening. Um, for North Fremont and Lighthouse, it's been around ten thousand five hundred dollars. And um, for each of the BIDs, it's been around right. $1,500. And that's not included in the assessments we're talking about right now? No, the budgets that you saw this afternoon, um, we asked all of the business improvement districts to take out the city contribution. Um, and then if the city council decides to add that as part of their budgetary process, they will obviously be able to supplement their projects and funding. Yes, because I did notice some very large reserves in I think that needs a, a deeper conversation with respect to the city role if we have uh, such big reserves already in those districts. But that's just a question we can talk about later. And do we have to, uh, and again, uh, thank you. That's our intelligent community development director giving that nice report. Do we have to go, are we going to do through the process of seeing how many uh, vote, protest votes and so on that we have, or did I miss that one too already? You do need to pay open the public hearing and accept any protest votes that you receive. But it's and not the, like the assessment districts that you're thinking of for Cali P and Alvarado district. We actually open envelopes. It's a protest hearing. Yes. You'll accept verbal or written comments. Got it. Thank you. It's not that that uh, senior millennials forget things. It's because senior, senior millennials have too many things to remember. So now I get it. Oh, so, okay, unless there are no council questions, let's uh, open the public hearing. And this would be for protests only is my understanding, Clementine? I think we could receive all comments is my understanding. Okay, we'll receive all comments. So basically let's find out if uh, we have any input. And I'm, I'm uh, do we have an audience in the council chambers at all, Nat, this afternoon? Yes, we do, Mr. Mayor, and uh, OMB okay. Executive Director Rick Johnson is approaching the podium here. Okay. He's still Rick Johnson, right? I still am. <laughs> That's our running joke. <laughs> I'm the administrator for new Moderate, and I just wanted to clear up that. that um, is his mic on? We do not. You could have told me I don't push the button. That's the same with Johnson. <laughs> in New Monterey, we do not have reserves. Um, we do do the 25%, and we thank you very much for going ahead with that. The 10,500 allows us to go beyond just um, being online as far as the business district. We bring in far less money. We get the 25%, and the businesses the uh, fees are capped at $250. So that's why we bring in so much less because historically New Monterey has been little shops, a lot of incubator shops that come in, find out if they can make it or not in business and then often move to other parts of our town. Um, and a lot of minority businesses that are in that area. So the actual assessment caps, no matter how big the business is or how small, at $250 per year. Just to clear that up, when um, we're looking at reserves, we don't have any. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Rick. Is there anyone else in the chamber, Nat? No one else in the chamber is looking to speak on this item. All right, and we don't have any hands raised on Zoom, um, Mr. Mayor. Okay, very good. So again, bear with me. So we have, so this uh, would require a motion to levy the assessment and adopt the recommendation, correct? That is correct. Okay, there's it's not an ordinance, it's it's a resolution. That is correct, Mr. Mayor. Okay, well, they'll also move and do we have a second? Second. A discussion? 
All right. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Hoffa? Yes. Councilmember Albert? Yes. Councilmember Smith? Yes. Councilmember Williamson? Yes. And Mayor Roberson? And a yes for me. Yes. That carries 5 0. Did someone say something? Nope. Okay, we're good. All right. Let's continue then to another really important and prideful thing that we can do on item 16, and that's to recognize June 2022 as LGBTQ Pride Month and authorize Pride Flag display at City Hall for the month of June. There's also a really excellent detailed resolution that I would encourage everyone to read. Uh, it's so well written. So with that, I will turn it back to uh, our city manager. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is uh, the second year uh, in a row or the second year that the city of Monterey is uh, recognizing uh, the month of June as the LGBTQ plus Pride Month and uh, that it also authorizes us to do display the flag at uh, City Hall uh, um, during the um, period of the month of June. Um, so that's uh, that's all about um, the staff report that we have to present tonight. All right. Any uh, council questions before we go to the public? All right. Let's see if we have public comment. None here in council chambers. Okay. Online. No, not at this time. All right. Back to the council. Council Member Tyler, please. Yeah. So I just wanted to make a few remarks um, on on the topic here. And uh, I think the most obvious thing about Pride Month is the opportunity for us to celebrate um, what queerness means and the contributions that have been made by uh, queer leaders in the community uh, for particularly for a lot of us in, in some of the younger generations that um, didn't really contribute to what initiated Pride Month which was things like Stonewall Riot, and that's identified in the in the resolution. Um, but there's also a recognition that there's still um, a lot of work to be done. So when we look at you know what's happening today in, in today's time, um, we see the don't say gay um, efforts happening in Florida. Um, we see ban on uh, against trans uh, folks in sports. Um, there's the ban on gender affirming health care for transgender youth in Texas. Um, and then most recently in Texas, they've also tried to create a ban on minors attending drag shows, which, I mean, the idea of some of these policies, of all these policies are, are crazy. And we may want to say to ourselves, well, we, we live in California, California is is safe um i was talking to the mayor earlier today and you know we we queer people travel we we have family members that live in places um that are are more suppressive and um and, and these embers that start in certain places don't mean that they can't exist in the future um in places like where we live so we have to continue that push um and even here within the state of california I think that there's opportunities for us to stay at the forefront of um, that leadership image that we have for um, for issues like um, social issues like uh, gender and sexual identity. Um, and one of those examples that we could do is do a better job of backing up um, our budget um, with supporting LGBTQ plus services. Um, within the state of California, we see we've seen a lot of things in recent times around, you know, updating uh, identification cards so that they can ident identify an alternative gender identity. Um, but these are kind of easier policies to uh, push through. But I think when you when it comes time to talking about the budget, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Hmm. Um, and and you know, a big thing um, that we feel as we look at the issue of um, the LGBTQ plus community is gay marriage. 
And I think that that's a, like a cornerstone that a lot of people look at in regards to seeing the progression of how things are so much better for the queer community. That's one little sliver of an issue that affects the, the queer community. And although that's appreciated and, and allows um, some signage that things are moving forward, there, there is still so much work to do. And just to give an example, um, there, we talk about things like re reproductive rights and that's a, a hot button issue right now. Um, there's also issues like racial equity and the latter of those um, are I think another example of where the state of California can do um, a lot more work in that area. Um, the impacts on the intersectionality um, for queer people of color um, have huge issues like economic impacts, healthcare and housing. Um, so kind of bringing this to somewhat of a conclusion, the future is so unknown um, and none of us can predict what exactly is going to happen. So one thing we do know though, is that the LGBTQ plus community is more vulnerable and at risk of harm. We see it in higher rates of homelessness, suicide and depression in comparison to our straight cisgender counterparts and our worse for youth. Um, so let, because that's what we do best this month. Um, and, and I kind of will take a little bit of a side note here and say, if you haven't been able to attend um, a pride celebration, then I'd highly encourage you to do so. And, and even going further on that point, um, we need you to stand with us. So um, I, I hope that uh, folks can, can come out and join us. You know that Monterey Pride, we're, we're planning to have the Pride celebration in the city of Monterey, Monterey again this year on July 23rd. So maybe I'll use this as a moment to say mark your calendars. Um, <laughs> but the celebration is only the beginning of what makes Pride Month Pride Month. We have a lot of work to do to make it visible to my query. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Any other council comments? Are we ready to make a motion, anyone? Uh, I'll move to approve the resolution. Thank you. Second. We have a motion and a second. More discussion? All right. Thank you, Tyler. Very eloquently expressed. We appreciate that. Roll call, please. Councilmember Albert? Yes. Councilmember Hoffa? Yes. Councilmember Williamson? Yes. Councilmember Smith? Sorry, you're uh, you're muted. Sorry about that. Yes. Okay. And Mayor Roberson? Yes. And motion carries 5-0. And let's go ahead for last afternoon item. And that's to authorize the mayor to sign an open letter to Congress for sensible federal legislation to curb gun violence. So again, I'll turn it back to our very knowledgeable staff to give a summary of our action, please. Yeah, and uh, in a... Um, in a, uh, in a short moment, our assistant city manager will present that topic to you. Yes, thanks. Great. Uh, Mayor and City Council, thank you uh, for your time this afternoon. As many of you know, uh, no city in the United States, including the city of Monterey, is immune from gun violence. And stronger federal laws could help reduce gun violence and prevent the deaths of innocent residents. We've uh, recently seen the mass shootings in Uvalde, Texas, of course, unfortunately, we know about Buffalo, New York, Parkland, Florida, Newtown, Connecticut, and in California, Sacramento, San Jose, Gilroy, Thousand Oaks, San Bernardino, and many other communities. Uh, what we're taking before you uh, this afternoon as a staff recommendation is to authorize the mayor to sign an open letter to Congress for sensible federal legislation to curb gun violence. And this is to join specifically the National League of Cities, which has prepared and is asking cities to adopt uh, this open letter that pleads bipartisan leaders to enact stronger federal laws to protect communities, families, and children, and to both keep guns out of the hands of those who intend to commit violence, as well as to strengthen mental, mental health systems. Here in California, 2022 so far, 22 mass shootings resulting in 36 deaths, 86 injuries, and in May alone, five mass shootings, five deaths, 22 injuries. And because we're uh, the, one of the largest states, uh, we do lead the nation in mass shootings and in school shootings. And as we look at gun violence facts and figures for the United States so far this year, 
244 mass shootings leading to 256 deaths, over 1,000 injuries. In the month of May alone, 44 mass shootings, 60 deaths and 109 injuries. And uh, you, you can see here that uh, from a policy standpoint, California is ranked number one in gun safety, which results in a death rate that is 37% lower than the national average. And Californians are 25% less likely to die in mass shootings. Still means that uh, there are opportunities at the federal level to enact stricter gun laws and result in fewer instances of gun violence. As you can see here, this is the rate of firearm homicides per capita based on per 100,000 population. And uh, you, the chart really speaks itself, uh, US at 4.12 rate uh, compared to Canada 0 0.5, Greece 0 0.35, uh, UK 0 0.04, Japan at the bottom there as well. And uh, mandatory training and exams, physical mental health assessments before licensing and mandatory buyback programs, and also banning the sale of certain firearms are some of the benefits of these policies. So in summary, the letter that is uh, being recommended uh, for the mayor to sign does a few things. Number one, shuts down the illegal sale and distribution of firearms and gun trafficking. Number two, requires a waiting period of up to 30 days for the purchase or transfer of all guns to check the criminal and mental health status of purchasers. Number three, it bans the, it would ban the manufacturer sale, importation or transfer of all automatic and semi-automatic assault type weapons. Number four, require the Department of Justice to work with state and local law enforcement to target and penalize licensed and unlicensed individuals who knowingly sell to prohibited individuals. Number five, would help state and local governments enact extreme risk protection orders, also known as red flag laws. State of New York uh, just adopted this recently. Item six would require every state to include people who've been adjudicated as mentally ill or have been committed to any mental institution to be added as a prohibited person in the National Instant Criminal Background Check System. Number seven would establish a National Commission to recommend legislative solutions aimed at reducing gun violence in the United States. Eight, ensure that all Americans have access to adequate physical and mental health care. And point number nine in this letter would increase federal funding for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to support data and indicators that would inform local strategy in cities and towns across our country as they address the issue of violence in their communities. That summarizes the, the letter. Uh, the attachment is part of the agenda packet and staff would be happy to answer any questions that you have. All right, Nat, thanks for that excellent overview. Any council questions before we go to the public? Uh, council member Tyler, you have a question, please? Yeah, I'm wondering, um, are the policy proposals that we have in this letter, are they all of the proposals that are being presented from the uh, National League of Cities. Yes, Councilmember Williamson, uh, that is correct. Uh, the staff have made no changes to the proposed National League of Cities letter. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to clarify that. And then um, my uh, my second and last question here is: um, Are there is there possible policy proposals that we can implement within the City of Monterey regarding gun ownership? This is an item that uh, staff is currently researching. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, any other questions? If not, let's see if we have any public comment. Nat, Nat anyone in the chamber? No one here in the city council chambers. All right, and we don't have hands raised online either. All right, then I'll close the uh, public section of it, bring it back to the council. I would make the motion, but it authorizes me to sign it. So I'd probably better if someone else makes that motion. Uh, I'll, I'll make the motion. We have a motion okay. by Councilman Brad, seconded by somebody. <laughs> I'll second. Dan. Dan. Councilmember Dan. All right. So roll call, please. Uh, Mayor, before we go to oh, discussion, my bad. Yes, please. Councilmember Ed. Yeah, thank you very much. Just a brief comment. Yeah, uh, I, I very closely read through these and validated through the National League California, uh, the National League of Cities, 
And also, um, I just want to make a point that I think the most valuable point there is that we need to call for a national commission. If you put every police chief in California and every sheriff in the room, it would take them about 15 minutes to hone in on uh, the cause and effect and very quickly be able to uh, assist our state legislation to enhance it even more. Now, California is a lot further along than many states are, but the National Commission needs to move to each of the states. We have the data, we have the information, and we need to move on many of the things that are suggested here. And number one is the red flag systems and the data <clears throat> gathering and a 30 day background check of those that have applied to be a gun owner. There's no way possible to do that in 10 days in California. So um, just ironically today, I was at a gun shop and uh, we talked about this. And I think you'll find overwhelming support among gun owners for this initiative. So I just stand to say that there's a lot of things that can be done here. Uh, and it's the balance of still allowing gun ownership under uh, the second amendment. But we need to make changes to make sure that the uh, wrong guns are not in the hands of the wrong people. So uh, wholeheartedly support this effort to get it started. Thank you, Council Member Ed. And Council Member well, Allen, please. Yeah, Council Member Ed said it really well and mm -hmm. appreciated his insights as a as a law enforcement expert. Um, I just note that, you know, Congress is now engaging in bipartisan talks. Um, obviously, our action is, is symbolic, but uh, hopefully it does send a message along with other cities that we want Congress to take, you know, bipartisan action, common sense kind of reforms um, along the lines of what Ed was talking about. And we did it before, you know, back in 1993 after, you know, the horrific assassination attempt on President Reagan and the Brady Bill um, was mm -hmm. signed in a bipartisan way. And it did have positive effect before it, um, you know, um, term limited out or ended. So we can get it done. And, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully this is the time that something happens, so. Yes. You know, I'll just share one last note, if I may, Mayor. Yes, please. Um, last week I had attended a candlelight vigil um, and it was uh, it, it, very emotional um, mm -hmm. because we all stood in a circle and we got, everybody got to go around the room um, and share their feelings about what happened um, in Evaldi, Texas. And as people are talking, I can see parents holding and grabbing their children tighter. Um, and so I, I just kind of want to echo what you're you're saying, Ed and, and Alan, in regards to um, hopefully this being a time where we can we can move the ball forward. And and it's not about taking guns out of everybody's hands. It's about taking them out of the wrong people's hands and making sure that the wrong people don't get them in the first place, have sensible reforms that make our community safer, which is what we all want. Um, so even here in California, I, th I think people are, are scared and worried. And so I think mm -hmm. us being proactive about things, I, I'm interested in seeing what staff is able to research and, and it would be great to hear back um, the results of, of that analysis one way or another. But thanks for bringing this forward. Yeah, very much so. You know, as an elementary school teacher for 35 years, and, and when I hear about and witness this sort of thing, and if you transfer it to, uh, in a, on a personal level, what the, what the tragedy is, then I'll be, I'll be sorry. And uh, our grown children are elementary school teachers. We have children in schools and to be living with this fear, it's unthinkable. Roll call, please. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Albert? Yes. Council Member Hoffa? Yes. Council Member Williamson? Yes. And Mayor Roberson? Yes. 
Um, we're going to go to closed session. Uh, do we have any public comment on the closed session items? Uh, unfortunately, well, our closed session will be not too long this uh, afternoon, but perhaps we'll be able to get to more of it this evening. Any uh, comments in the council chambers or online? Not here in city council chambers, Mr. Mayor. Nope, not online. All right, we will adjourn to closed session. And um, the first one who gets onto the new link wins the prize. We'll see you shortly.
Russ. All right. Well, we welcome everybody with a warm welcome to our evening session. And we will go ahead. And before um, we call the meeting to order, I think it's always good practice to ask our laudable city uh, clerk to read how people can participate in our meeting with this hybrid meeting. So Clementine, to you. Uh, the city of Monterey is committed to the safe attendance of its public meetings. Masks are strongly recommended for all who attend in person, regardless of vaccination status, except those who are younger than two years old or have a medical condition that prevents wearing a mask. Attendees in the council chamber, please keep your phones and devices muted to prevent audio interference. There are two ways to virtually participate in today's meeting. You may join using the Zoom app on your computer or, or mobile device, and you can also call into the Zoom meeting. To join the meeting on Zoom on your computer, smartphone, or telephone, use the link or phone number on the agenda at iSearchMonterey.org. An up-to-date version of the Zoom software must be used. To call in by telephone, dial toll-free 833-568-8864 and enter meeting ID 160-772-9333, pound. And if prompted to enter a participant ID, press pound. Detailed instructions on using and updating Zoom are available at monterey.org slash public meetings. To make a public comment using the Zoom app, you can virtually raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. If you dialed in by phone, raise your hand by dialing star nine and then unmute yourself when called upon by dialing star six. You must do both. Hmm. Public commenters will be muted until it is their turn to speak. I'll call on each public speaker in the order of their hands raised. Please stay within the time limit established for today's meeting and a timer will be shown on the screen. If you're connected live on Zoom, the timer is accurate with no delay. Today's meeting is also streamed live on the city's YouTube account at youtube.com slash city of Monterey with about 10 seconds delay and on Comcast channel 25 up to 90 seconds delay. We look forward to receiving your public comment. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Nicely done. Would you please uh, sh we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance, so would you be able to put uh, the flag above Colton Hall on our screen, please? There it is, and I ask everyone to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, the flag to the flag of the United States, United America. States of America. And to the Republic. And to the Republic yes. for which it stands. And one nation. One nation. God. Indivisible, Indivisible with liberty, with liberty and, justice and justice for all. And then once again, as always, please introduce your caring city council, Clementine. Council member Albert. Here. Council member Hoffa. Here. Council member Smith. Here. Council member Williamson. Here. And Mayor Roberson. And I'm here as well. All right, the first item is continued public comments and that is the public has an opportunity for a maximum of three minutes to talk on any subject not on the agenda so if you wanted to talk about our one item this evening the budget please wait until we get to that and you will have an opportunity to speak we guarantee it and you can always reach the city of monterey at suggest at monterey.org and public commenters if you want a response if you can leave a contact either this evening or at suggestmonterey.org our wonderful staff will get back to you so with that uh, let's go ahead and start with general public comments not on the agenda how are we looking in the council chambers please matt uh, we have uh, one member of the public in line waiting to speak at the podium for items not on the agenda all right then welcome and please go ahead Thank you. Oh, okay. I'm stuck. <laughs> uh, hello, uh, honorable city council members. Um, my name is Jeannie Ferrara. I'm a homeowner in Monterey Vista neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't believe that this item is on the agenda, but it's in the agenda packet. It's, um, it's concerning NCIP, the neighborhood uh, improvement projects. It says on page 108 of the packet that, um, 4.96 million uh, has been uh, given back to the NCIP from the general fund. This is um, money give, given back um, from the 13 million that was taken from NCIP at the beginning of COVID. 
Um, so it's it's uh, NCIP's money. Um, it was there already. And um, it says that the staff has suggested um, allocating 2 million of this towards unspecified capital improvements projects and bond payments for the sports center. And um, I want to say that I'm very opposed to this. Um, I live in that neighborhood and um, the sports center gets membership money from every person that uses the facility and they get money from other other places as well. Uh, property owners pay multiple thousands of dollars every year in property taxes and deserve to have their neighborhoods improved. Um, so uh, I just wanted on the record that I am very much opposed to this and uh, thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Jeannie. Actually, uh, theoretically, you sh actually should have waited, but since you already started, we certainly wanted to let you finish your comments because that is part of the budget hearing. So. Other things not on the agenda? If Again, if you wanna talk about the budget and recommendations and so on, which obviously we want this evening, that's the whole point of our hearing this evening. It's not for the council to adopt the budget, but to get everybody's input. So at our next meeting, we're able to go forward. So items not on the agenda, how about online? No, sir. And no one else in the chambers? No one else in the chambers. All right, then at that point, then we will close uh, public comments. Announcements from closed session, please. Yes, there was one closed session item that was heard and it was um, a conference with real property negotiators, Kimberly Cole and Jana Aldretti um, on a, um, a property at 380 Alvarado Street, suites 101 and 201 with negotiated party Mia Cruz of Bliss Boutique and under negotiation or terms and conditions for a lease amendment. And um, on a unanimous roll call vote, the city council gave confidential direction to their real property negotiators. All right, thank you for that update. So now we can go ahead to our one and only public appearance item this evening. And that's a presentation on the plenary, preliminary 2022-23 operating budget. And as I, I had just mentioned here momentarily, this is an opportunity for our excellent staff to present what they have so far. It's This has been a very difficult budget in many ways. First of all, we have to remember that we were, were just coming out of a pandemic where we lost $33 million in our general fund, which was three eighths. And a lot of uh, cities, jurisdictions, and counties received a big chunk of money from the federal government and the state. Monterey did not. And so last year, the city did have to make some drastic decisions. One of the hardest things that a council ever does, and that is layoffs or freezing positions. And then last year, as was um, suggested, Money was taken from the NCIP. That is part of the charter provision with a four-fifths vote in order to balance the budget. And also we're entering the, entering the new normal. Uh, going forward, if you've, we're, we're not alone. I, I read the county where the county has a balanced budget, but next year they're looking at a $32 million potential deficit. They have a structural deficit. And Monterey similarly faces a structural deficit, which means it's more or less systemic, but it's in, within the structure of the organization. And that's why going forward, we have to look at the new normal. We had two ballot measures, and in both those ballot measures, the half cent sales tax increase, as well as the 2% TOT increase, it was explained to the voters that the new normal was going to require that the city not start new programs and correct the structural deficit. So while we're, we're doing much better, it's not all doom and gloom, we still have many challenges before us and it's somewhat of a, a, a target, a moving target. And we just, I just saw an email. And by the way, when you email us, I do put them in the public record about where Monterey County is now in the high um, infection rates. So <clears throat> CDC is suggesting masks indoors again. It's not a mandate. 
And so we really don't know. So dependent on hotel motel taxes and sales taxes, which is many in many ways driven by tourism. So personally, I can't say we're out of the woods, frankly. So we have to define the new normal. And I think this budget is probably one of the first steps. And I know the staff has labored over this. It's been really challenging. My kudos, compliments. They have been extraordinary, learned and luminous on working through this. And again, a budget doesn't necessarily mean that's it's cast in iron, just like you budget at home, things come up, you have to be flexible, but this is a target at the 22-23 budget. So with that, we'll turn it over to our uh, very memorable uh, city manager, Hans Uslar, and we're gonna be hearing from our meticulous Rafaela King, and so we're very happy that we have these professionals to help us go through this. So they're gonna make a presentation. Then at the conclusion, I'm gonna ask our city manager and finance director what they expect from the public and council this evening. What do they wanna hear? What do they wanna know? So we can come up with the final budget. Hans, to you, please. Yeah, I um, need to get Paige up here. Yeah, okay. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I want to just remark that in the afternoon session, I was an inspiring city manager. And in the evening session, you called me memorable. Um, yes. So uh, I hope this presentation goes well tonight. <laughs> it always does. I'm not a bit worried. <laughs> uh, the wrong presentation. One second. That it doesn't look like a presentation. Let's see. Can you just look what's going on? Yep. Do you want me to share the screen and you can just tell me when to advance? Yeah. Share your screen. I, I can do that. Just one moment. Mark can go over and still trying to load it. <laughs> Let me come over. That way you can. Oh, this is, let's see. I think this is the one. Yeah, there we go. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, I hope uh, the suspense is not killing anyone. Um, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, uh, council members uh, and public, um, tonight I will present to you our uh, preliminary FY22 operating budget in, in greater detail. And um, uh, it's not forwarding here. Why is this now? Okay. Uh, oh, it's it's the wrong presentation again. I uh, hang on. Never happened. And why is that? It shows a different one on the on the laptop. It shows the right one on the laptop, but when I do share screen, it's the wrong one. Hang on. Hmm. Can you pull up the the other one? Sure. Is uh, this the right one? Yes. Okay. For me to go ahead and yeah. Share the screen here. What is with slide three? Hmm? What is the next? Why is the next slide not popping up? I think it's uh, it's hidden for some reason, Hans. Huh? It's, uh, it's hidden for some reason. Yeah, there you go. There we go. Okay. So we, we are there. Thank you so much for your patience and my apologies. Um, okay, we, we'll leave it in Nat's hand and then he he will help me. Uh, here's, here's what we will discuss tonight. Um, like two weeks ago, uh, I'd like to share with you a good news, bad news story that um, is coming forward in, in the calendar year 2022, and it will influence also fiscal year 22-23. Uh, 
Um, I will talk about our revenue expenditure challenges and uh, thankfully the, the mayor has already set up the uh, general outline of that and I will talk about our uh, cherished sports center. Um, as staff, we're making three recommendations uh, to, to council tonight uh, for council's consideration and uh, input by council and the public. And then also our finance director will go and dive into some of the deeper details and talk about uh, the budget uh, in, in much greater detail than I will cover. And, he, and she will talk also about um, our general fund situation as well as the uh, fund situation in the various enterprise funds. We will just focus on the main enterprise funds because we have really quite a lot of funds uh, uh, within our city portfolio. Next slide, please. As the mayor pointed out, we uh, we have been doing quite a lot. Uh, our plan started in 2018. Uh, we called it the Fiscal Health Response Plan. We developed a few strategies for that and uh, quite a number of those strategies we have implemented. We talked about uh, adjusting our revenue stream. Uh, we, we implemented tax measures, the mayor uh, just spoke about two of them. Uh, we also had measure P, measure S, which is a 1% sales tax increase dedicated completely to uh, maintenance in, in the roadway, storm drain maintenance and ADA improvements and sidewalk improvements. And we also um, had a 1%, uh, a half a cent sales tax increase as the mayor mentioned. And we talked also about the increase of the TOT that went from 10% uh, to 12%. TOT is our hotel tax. Uh, we took care of our fees. Uh, we hadn't updated quite a number of years our fees for many good reasons. And we adjusted those fees as, uh, very uh, sensitively over the past two, three years as well. Um, and we, we looked at how can we cut our own operational expenses. Uh, we looked uh, not just at supplies and operation or programs, we also looked at personnel uh, and through labor negotiations also we changed some of the contractual memoranda of understanding that we have in place and we, we try to really focus on uh, reducing our cost. What, I'm, what we also did with that is we wanted to uh, bring us back into the labor market in those areas where we definitely we're probably exceeding uh, in some of the, the benefits or some of the uh, other uh, incentives that we had in our labor contract. So we worked uh, at a time when everyone was booming. We worked actually in, in concession bargaining uh, for, for, some, uh, for some time. So we, we worked on all those various um, elements. Uh, it's part of our fiscal health response plan that we are still adhering to. And it has guided us uh, since 2018. Next slide. The mayor spoke about that. Um, we we were extremely uh, uh, hit uh, hard by the pandemic. Uh, 32 million dollars in losses in just 18 months is uh, is a really big impact on a general fund uh, that is an annual general fund at the time was something over 80 million dollars. So. Uh, we lost $32 million in revenues, uh, mainly in uh, hospitality-based uh, revenues, uh, hotel tax and sales tax evaporated. A lot of surrounding uh, taxes also evaporated, like parking revenue went down. Uh, our uh, main facilities, uh, conference center, sports center, uh, had to shut down. We lost revenues there. Um, and of course, we had to react with that. And what we also did at that time was uh, we uh, had to lay off 84 people. Uh, we had to freeze 20 additional positions. Uh, we asked our labor groups for pay cuts, uh, and they agreed to that on, on various levels uh, with different approaches. But the executive managers, the managers, the police and fire all shipped in and helped out. And uh, we had to delay infrastructure projects. Uh, we, um, we also had to go and uh, rate the NCIP fund at that time. And they supported it not with $13 million, as the previous speaker indicated. It was a number around $9 million, but still significant and very helpful. 
the city's uh, delayed infrastructure project as well from the CIP fund at a tune of something like uh, close to $2 million. Um, what else happened? Uh, programs were, were eliminated, uh, uh, library, sports center, community center uh, were all closed. And uh, we had to also uh, delay uh, information technology upgrades uh, uh, in, in various areas. Next slide, please. When I look at today's budget and I look at today's forecast, I, 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 we are facing uh, the following challenge. We see uh, record tax revenue. Sales tax has uh, rebounded uh, from our perspective. Now, that doesn't mean that every single business is is very, very much uh, um, writing new record numbers, but we have quite a number of, quite a large number of businesses that are back and better where they were in 2019. Uh, we also see that uh, the hotel tax uh, is coming in strong. Uh, this year alone, we, we expect uh, a number that will be around $32 million in, in, in uh, hotel tax. Um, we also have fewer full-time staff. Uh, we haven't hired every single one back. Uh, as a matter of fact, council uh, hears uh, quite regularly from constituents who say, well, we want this person back or we want that um, uh, center filled with more people here and we are missing this person, etc." cetera. Um, so, the, the uh, challenge is we have fewer full-time staff right now because, uh, like I said, we laid people off. We froze positions, uh, about 102 in total, and we hired back probably about 40 so far. Mm -hmm. So we have less personnel costs, but what is happening, our expenditures still outpace our revenues. So that's not something we can uh, sustain for a long, long time. Next slide. Uh, what we see is uh, the group and business travel is affecting uh, the hospitality industry still. Uh, while leisure travelers are back, uh, we see that the conference center does not have all the group businesses back that they usually would see in the conference center. We have quite a number of events there, but the groups, uh, most of the groups are rather small, anywhere between 40 to 90 people there. And our midweek business is really uh, lagging uh, behind. Again, it's made up uh, to a degree by leisure travelers, but of course the conference center is um, is an interesting business because they bring in actually visitors who are spending more money uh, per day per person in the city than a leisure traveler does. They have a smaller uh, greenhouse gas footprint because they usually stay all around the conference center and are very rigid in the program. And uh, the, the, the city during the midweek uh, reaps a lot of benefits for a lot of businesses around there, but also inside the conference center when we sell uh, through our caterer, the luncheons and the dinners, and when we have IAB, audiovisual revenues and setup revenues and room rates and et cetera. So, it is, um, it is a very good business for the city. Uh, again, uh, keep in mind the environmental aspect of that. They are not usually coming down in, in, in cars or, or traveling around in cars. Um, uh, but uh, um, the conference center is, is also trying to, to catch up to previous data points that we had in 2019. 2019. Uh, we see uh, or afraid, or we are afraid that the high inflation can, can lead to fewer visitor spending in Monterey. Uh, third quarter earnings or first quarter earnings, I believe, is, is the right number of the mobile, uh, uh, the gas and oil industry is uh, surprisingly up by 300%. Uh, but uh, uh, we pay at the pump a price anywhere between five, six, seven dollars right now. That will have an impact on that. Um, what we saw in the month of May, uh, just completed May, and we have folks here from the business side here from Canary Row, we, we see in our data a softening in the market. And uh, I don't know if you have seen that, but uh, we, we see uh, in, uh, in the travel behavior, at least the data points that we are following closely, uh, somewhat uh, a slight softening. Now, this could be just that we had a lousy May and a good April, 
uh, and the June will show us what it is, but uh, it's it's uh, it's a challenge that we have to look at. How are we looking at um, the inflation? Uh, I've talked about it before, and I will talk about it a little bit more. Uh, also, our sports center um, is has not rebounded completely, or is not there where it should be. Um, a little later in my presentation, I will share with you actually. Um, a little glimmer of hope that that just that is happening as I speak, and um, so uh, I, I will put a little asterisk on this uh, third bullet point. Um, we are, we are facing uh, a war in the Ukraine with the potential to bleed over into a definite World War Three if if uh, um, reason doesn't prevail. Um, so what will the war do, do to us? And um, uh, I just, uh, you get word from everyone right now, and the mayor spoke about that, that uh, the, the COVID numbers are increasing again, and that you have um, uh, mask mandates again uh, implemented by, uh, by, by some counties. And you see also that it's uh, right now recommended for high-risk county in which Monterey, uh, county of Monterey right now is. So what will the COVID do to us uh, uh, over the next couple of months uh, as well? Um, we are estimating that 22% of the TOT will um, bypass uh, the normal discretionary funding of the council, uh, which is about $7 million. NCIP uh, but per charter receives 16%. And the MCCVB, which is uh, the des destination marketing company for the region, or agency, I should say, not company, it's a nonprofit. The MCCVB will receive uh, about 6% of that. Next slide. Um, so I spoke on, on the revenue challenges. Uh, there are expenditure challenges as well. Our operational costs are going up. Uh, everyone, uh, uh, every single household uh, uh, in Monterey or in California or in our nation are experiencing increased cost for supplies for goods. Uh, our insurance rates in the city of Monterey went um, pretty high up uh, for our buildings that we have to insure, not just healthcare. Uh, utilities are, are going through the roof. We are saving on water sing every single year. We are reducing our water bill. Uh, Colton Hall lawn in front of uh, this building right now uh, looks mildly green, but uh, those of you will remember how it looked in, in previous years, dark green. So, so we try to keep up with all of that, but our utility costs go up and up every single uh, every single year while we are reducing actually energy and utilities consumption. Um, we have to address uh, as a must our unfunded pension liability. Uh, it's right now calculated at $173.6 million, but uh, this is a floating number. It, it, it is not uh, fixed in stone. It depends on how uh, overall the investments are doing that are helping to um, uh, pay for the CalPERS pensions. Uh, so this is not a, a fixed number. So if you pay today $173.6 million, um, tomorrow the stock market might change and it might cost you just $150 million to pay, but we have to look at unfunded pension liability as well. Uh, you heard it in some of the feedback that council has received in, in front of the, before this uh, council meeting, uh, where residents say, hey, you, you, make, you have to make, uh, uh, put money uh, aside, set money aside for facility reserves. You have to set money aside for the sports center. You have to set money aside for the conference center, et cetera. We have done that. We started that at mid-year when we um, substantially put money into reserves uh, and, and uh, are um, acknowledging also this obligation towards our city's asset and also towards our city voters who, uh, with the tax measures, also ask us, as the mayor indicated, don't start any new programs, just see that you can maintain what you have in stock right now. And that's what we are doing. Um, we, we will continue to pay for destination marketing at 6%, uh, $1.8 million. Later, I think there's a slide that, that explains that number a little bit better. Uh, but it's it's my duty to always point out that those 1.8 million dollars of the TOT that go for destination marketing 
gets um, uh, subtracted by $350,000 that the MCCVB returns to us to uh, help pay for the conference center bond. So it's, it's, it's actually net 4.9%, which go towards regional marketing from the city of Monterey. We, we keep paying for the trolley services, uh, that, that is a cherished service uh, uh, starting on Memorial Day, ending on Labor Day. We cover 75% of the cost, uh, which brings um, the visitors into business districts and to the aquarium, which uh, pays uh, another almost 25% then to, to make MST whole for, the, for that service. Uh, we, we're spending uh, money for business districts, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. We will also have in the budget, again, $35,000 that we will uh, allocate to First Night Monterey. That is a signature event that brings people into downtown, and also it's, it's a signature event that brings people into town. And uh, our other challenge that we have to deal with right now is that all our labor contracts are up for negotiations. And uh, our employees uh, are like uh, the folks listening to us right now. They have increased utility costs. They see that their cereal boxes are shrinking in weight and still cost the same. And they still have the challenges with rent and uh, uh, challenges at the gas pump and challenges with the utilities. So uh, you cannot simply say, well, let's not just give them pay raises um, and, and um, fix the city's budget on the back of, of police officers, firefighters, librarians, et cetera. So we, uh, we are negotiating right now with them and uh, there's nothing more and nothing less than what we have to offer to our employees, which is uh, fairness. And we have to do fair salary adjustments for our city workforce. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a slide that shows you there are two different uh, sides to pension liability. One is the side for the miscellaneous employees uh, and the other slide shows you the slide for public safety. The unfunded liability for miscellaneous employees, which is the bulk of our employees, is about $98 million, 98.8. And for public safety, which is, uh, in essence, police and fire, is $74.8 million. So again, just a quick insight where we are today based on the latest actuarial report. Next slide. We spoke about it, uh, customers have not returned uh, to the pre-pandemic uh, levels. I spoke about the conference center and I wanted to share with you also that every single spike, every single minor surge in, in the pandemic influences our bookings. Uh, we, we see uh, that some groups immediately uh, cancel uh, and bail out. What we also see though, is those groups are then saying, well, but we'd like to come back in three months or we'd like to back, come back in four months. Uh, do you have space for us? Uh, in in um, 2020, 21, it was more like, let's book 12 months later. So we see a, a trend there as well, but it's a very volatile market. Um, sports center industry has not returned to pre-pandemic. We see this in, uh, in Montage, uh, the wellness center out in Marina. We see this also in the fitness center in, in shape. You will notice that they have closed some of their satellite facilities that they operated in, in, in other cities and try to consolidate everything uh, on North Fremont Street. And we also see that in the library that we have not uh, seen all our patrons uh, return at, at the Monterey Library yet. Again, the benchmark for us is 2019. Thank you, next slide. Uh, so with that, I, I'm approaching the Neighborhood Community Improvement Program and my, my first recommendation, and I, I'm sure that there are quite a few folks that, that are following that conversation right now. Um, I want to share with you that the NCIP is, 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 the, is the most unique community-based programs that program that you can find here uh, in, in Monterey County, in the Tri-County, in the state of California, and in, in, in the United States for that. We have not seen any other program like our NCIP anywhere else copied. Um, what is the NCIP, the Neighborhood Community Improvement Program? Well, it's, it's the program that makes sure that the residents uh, are getting their fair share back in tourist dollars because uh, during summer and every weekend, we have thousands and thousands of people in town 
who want to come to Monterey, that who want to come to the Monterey Peninsula because it's just a beautiful place to live in. And uh, the NCIP uh, is a genius program that basically says, okay, since uh, we are sharing this beauty with, with everyone else, we'll make sure that our neighbors, our residents uh, who have to fight traffic and uh, have to live with all the pros and, and, and cons of tourism, that you have also your, your fair share of that. And 16% of the transient occupancy tax goes per ch city charter to the NCIP. And the NCIP over the years has been um, a great asset. It has helped the city uh, invest uh, into infrastructure, into uh, improvements into our neighborhood across the city and, and neighborhoods. Uh, so the NCIP is an absolutely important part uh, the, the NCIP committee uh, is part of the city families of, of uh, boards and commissions. And uh, another aspect that I personally always uh, cherish with the NCIP is that you have just uh, dozens of smart residents you deal with. Uh, they understand budgeting, they understand uh, project management, they understand CEQA, so, so they, they can actually explain to you what CEQA is. Uh, they they cherish uh, the cost. They know what value engineering is, and uh, some of them uh, become uh, become so so um, engaged that they actually want other positions in the city as well, and and want to serve on other boards and commissions. So it's a huge uh, democratic educational effect that the N NC NCIP is delivering. And here uh, I highlighted again what I said verbally earlier. They saved our bacon in 2020 uh, when we didn't know how to uh, how to get into the next uh, fiscal year without laying off police officers and firefighters. Uh, they they came through and helped us when the pandemic hit. So uh, I want to talk now about the next slide, which is uh, we are we are suggesting that the council looks into helping. Uh, uh, asking the NCIP to help us with um, uh, funding towards the sports center. Uh, the, the sports center, as I said, is is is, is twofold impacted for, during next fiscal year. Number one is uh, we are subsidizing, supporting uh, the, the, the sports center next fiscal year with a $2.5 million um, inflow of additional funds that are not offset by revenues. Let me say that again. The general fund will allocate an additional $2.5 million towards the sports center, uh, which are not offset by our expected revenues. And uh, again, remember, I shared with you that the patrons of the fitness industry have not yet returned to all their fitness facilities. Uh, people get heart attacks on Peloton, we read, but they are still exercising at home more than um, at the sports center. So uh, the the glimmer of hope that I wanted to share with you is that, uh, the, con that the sports center recently celebrated uh, their 30 year anniversary. 30 years ago, uh, the building was opened and uh, in June, 1992 and uh, um, the, the sports center, uh, we started a promotion there where we basically said, hey, come on, sign up, uh, 30 bucks a month. And uh, we had the pricing for one day for, for uh, that was equivalent to the pricing that we had in 1992. And what would you know, uh, on that day, we sold 489 memberships on one day. So uh, that's a real glimmer of hope. Uh, of course, people were wooed by our great offer. But once you have them back in the building and, and, and once that they see that the muscles are growing, uh, they, they will enjoy that and will continue coming to us. So we will continue to strategize and we actually have strategies in place to um, make it harder for them to switch back or to not come back. So that's the glimmer of hope that, that just happened last week where we had a, a real good uh, injection of 489 additional uh, memberships and 
What we also see is uh, that um, we are selling programming in summer right now for the sports center. Our swim classes are full, our other exercise classes for children are filling up. And uh, again, that's a good sign. Now, please remember also that the fee structure that we have in place in the sports center, as well as in the parks and recreation programming, which is filling up nicely as well, never ever cover the cost of the services we we have an affordable recreation programming but it's nevertheless uh, really hopeful for us to see those signups because then the number of the, the the number that is necessary to support the sports center through the general fund might actually go down a little bit or hopefully a lot so that is the one side we talked about the um the challenge of the revenues for the sports center but the other one is is uh, is the one that the recommendation number one is is going after which is right now today we have uh, major critical capital improvement projects that we cannot defer that we cannot postpone and uh, i'll show you in a second a list of those uh, those projects but we have a capital need right now of something between two to three million dollars in the sports center right now those of you have who have uh, revisited the sports center you have seen our slide is is uh, is blocked uh, it's not operational uh, we need to put about three hundred thousand four hundred thousand dollars into the water slide to 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 open it up again uh, the the biggest uh, challenge in in the sports center right now is that a piece of equipment that is called a dehumidifier dehumidifier that's basically um, a big machine that that sucks out the wet air over the swimming pool is uh, is in dire need of a replacement. We can put a bandaid on it for about sixty thousand dollars and hope it doesn't blow up, and uh, or we can really replace it. Now, why is this important to to get the water vapor water vapor? That's a hard word for a German to say. Um, Hawaii. Uh, it's it's hard to. Um, uh, it, we have to re take the water vapor out of the swimming pool air just because the vapor attacks the steel in the building. And uh, uh, if it attacks the steel, it starts rusting. And when you walk around the pool, uh, you will see rust already. So we that's a major capital expense that we have to do. And uh, we also have to replaster the pool and there are other things. So. Uh, we we have already allocated seven hundred fifty thousand dollars from the city funds. There, uh, as I said, we we have started creating facility reserves. We will we will need to use the seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, but we need also uh, two million dollars uh, from the NCIP. Again, the NCIP is looking at about four point nine six million dollars funding. Uh, Rafaela will show you later a number that is slightly over 5 million and um, if you see that number ask her why it's over 5 million and she will tell you why. Uh, I want to build a little bit of the suspense there but the point is uh, it's council can make that decision. Uh, it is uh, not required to go to the NCIP to ask for it. Uh, and frankly, we have no other funding sources available. Uh, our remaining CIP that we have for other uh, for all our assets in the city of Monterey from the general fund is $750,000 as well. So that's our challenge. So keep in mind, there are two challenges at the sports center right now. One is we will have a revenue shortfall there. We are fixing that by allocating two and a half million dollars from our general fund uh, revenues towards the sports center. And then the other one is a major CIP component that we, that is, um, coming uh, like a train towards us right now. Next slide, please. Uh, here, I promised you uh, that we have some more details from of projects. Um, I wanna uh, talk about uh, the, the number three is the dehumidifier replacement. That's about $1.2 million. Uh, we have, uh, if you look on the, on the further down, uh, pool replastering, water slide replacement, water slide repair, Etc. These are all the different um, uh, cost estimates that we have. Uh, in the middle, the, those orange uh, elements that you see, these are projects that we have funded already and that we continue to to implement. Uh, we have uh, we're cutting work orders right now for locker room upgrades, etc. We have funding for that available. But take a look at at the big ticket items. Those we cannot fund right now. Next slide, please. 
Um, so, of course, uh, as 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 a city manager, to talk about uh, asking the NCIP or taking from the NCIP two million dollars is um, is is shall we say not not usual. Uh, is 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 rather unusual. You usually do not go as a city manager that far to to say, hey, can the NCIP or council can you give us uh, allocate two million dollars? But here here's a question you have to ask yourself: uh, What would a family household do in a similar situation? Um, I, I always think the city is is a, is a family. Uh, we have a lot of. Um, uh, assets jointly together. We are funding it together with the tax, with the money that the taxpayers are giving us, the city, and that includes the hotel tax, that includes the 16% to the NCIP. And the scenario that, that I try to describe is just think about a family uh, sitting around a kitchen table, uh, has a fixed income, uh, is facing the same that we do, cost of living increases. Um, they have a mortgage that they can barely afford to pay right now because, as we all know, it's hard to get into homes. Uh, ele electricity goes up, water bills goes up, groceries goes up. Um, but you have really no funds for, for home repairs. But this family is a smart family. And it has basically said, okay, we allocate a certain amount of money uh, towards new projects. We religiously, we want to be sure that we have always money. So no matter rain or shine, um, we will allocate money to uh, new projects uh, to improve our home. So we may build a new deck. Uh, we may look at our landscaping and say, let's improve the landscaping. Our driveway is dilapidated. Let's take out the uh, asphalt there and put nice pavers in there. Uh, we might even try to build an ADU there. But now is the situation where bullet point one and bullet point two do not line up on him anymore. You, you are overwhelmed. You're looking at uh, the various things that you need to do and you run out of funding. So what are you doing? Are you sticking to your plan? Are you uh, looking to get a new deck? Uh, or are you cutting back? Uh, if you have to repair a roof, if you have to replace a furnace, uh, if you have to replace a refrigerator, what are you doing? Uh, are you uh, offsetting that with the enjoyment of a new deck or improved landscaping or pavers? That's the situation we are in right now when we are looking at asking to find additional funding for our sports center. Should we look at new things? Or shall we make sure that we find a solution that uh, helps us to uh, preserve what, what we have built, what, what we are using, what is a cherished community center? Next slide, please. So uh, I throw this in to have some humor here. Uh, the, the sports center next door rumor came up yesterday, and it was really fun to see. And uh, next door, which uh, some of you might think is a very serious uh, information platform, uh, created uh, uh, the rumor that uh, the city sold the sports center, um, which is not true. And the better rumor we heard also that the city has sold the sports center to Montage Health. So I wanted to make sure today to address those rumors. Nothing is true. Uh, we are not selling the sports center. Uh, we haven't sold it to Montage Health, uh, and and sure, if the city ever wants to sell the sports center, it will be not um, a deal done behind closed doors. You know, as a Monterrean, uh, what this will involve to even utter those words. So, I uh, just wanted to clarify that. Next slide, please. So, again, our request is. Uh, to look at $2 million, uh, take it from the NCIP funding and allocate it towards Sports Center. Um, the, the council uh, can do that. Uh, I pointed that already out. The city will contribute another 750,000 plus 250,000 as well to those projects. And um, that is the recommendation. As an alternative, uh, I, I think, uh, next slide, the council. The council can consider to encourage the NCIP. You could, uh, we have the time. You could ask the NCIP uh, to think like uh, I just explained the family 
uh, hopefully things around the kitchen table. They they look at what they have, they look at what they want, and they look at what needs they have. And you could do that. Uh, you could ask uh, tonight also to express with your uh, voices council uh, that NCIP really uh, look at what what uh, was presented tonight and uh, what kind of projects uh, of the list that that staff presented tonight would you like to fund towards the uh, Monterey Sports Center? Uh, and here are the number of projects that we need to have funded. But like I shared with you, we have funding also from the journal fund set aside. So together we, we can do it. Together we can do it. That's, that's my alternative suggestion to you for tonight. Okay, uh, deep breath number two, uh, suspend funding for business districts. We have quite a number of business district uh, folks here tonight um, that, that will probably uh, explain to you uh, why that is not a great idea either. Uh, $10,500 of general fund money goes to the new Monterey business district, to Canary Row and to North Fremont. Uh, I think it's about $55,000 that we are allocating to OMBA. And uh, $25,000 go to the Fisherman's Wharf Association annually. Um, tonight, you heard uh, a staff report uh, in the afternoon session was item number 15, in which uh, the community development director spoke about uh, starting this uh, the assessment fees again, that the businesses assess themselves. And you got an insight also in, in some of the uh, reserves and some of the funding that those business uh, associations have uh, on their side. Next slide. Uh, I, I, we created those slides just to say uh, loud and clear, um, we are for the business community. This is not an act against the business community. The, this city council, while we are in the midst of losing $32 million in revenues, while we were losing 102 employees uh, in April 2020, and keep in mind, uh, COVID hit us mid-March, in, in April 2020, the council allocated a million dollars in small business grants for local businesses. And uh, we have a GIS map where we basically um, put all the businesses out. It spread throughout the town. It spr spread from uh, uh, a hairstylist shop to uh, the Nina codes uh, uh, for kids where they learn how to code to restaurants. To, to secondhand stores, uh, et cetera. It, it is a, a wide array of, of business. Uh, we spend uh, close to a million dollars in, in small business grants in supporting small businesses in the city of Monterey. We realized that the businesses were losing employees uh, because uh, they were laying them off left and right. And uh, we realized we got to do something to keep them here. And that's when we created in the same time frame in April, uh, an emergency rental assistance program, the very, very first program. And no one else had that program uh, invented at that time. And we put $960,000 in city housing funds to that. This is not money that, that is handed to us from the federal government. Uh, this, these are funds that, that uh, were, were um, replenished, supplied for by city housing programming funds. We have quite a number of housing operations here in the city that provide us with annual revenues. This is the money that, that we gave to that. We also uh, eliminated a position and took that money of that position towards that rental assistance program as well. Think about that uh, in, in that time where we basically uh, put uh, uh, one employee into a different department and use those salary savings to fund the emergency rental program as well. We also had over 30 commercial properties uh, where city tenants uh, uh, were allowed to defer uh, rent their rent for, for, for some time. Uh, I, I shared this with, with you as well. Uh, in other cities, you have to pay for outdoor seating. Uh, for us, it was... Uh, you want outdoor seating, here it is, here are the rules and uh, go for it, enjoy. Over 50 no cost outdoor seating permits uh, were issued by us. And also in 2021, when, when we really didn't see yet a way forward, 
uh, we, we came up with funding for, uh, for the trolley and uh, substantially support, by the way, from MST, uh, Carl Sidoric and, and the bo entire board deserve credit for helping us uh, or helping fund the trolley with a substantial amount of money as well. So we are um, the premier partner for the business community. We are the premier partner for the business districts. But I have a second slide, next slide. Uh, we will, for f fiscal year 22-23, again, we will uh, continue to support the MCCVB. What does the MCCVB do? They bring the visitors into the business district. And uh, a notion that, that is of particular interest for me is that the Tourism Improvement District, the TID, is paid by hotels and the motels but not a single dime from the restaurants and other tourism-based businesses go towards destination marketing. Um, in fact, they all benefit from regional destination marketing, but uh, last but not least, they can spend their marketing dollars on their own marketing purposes, which they do. In all fairness, we have to recognize that. But uh, that's a big chunk. The city of Monterey is the, the single largest uh, uh, entity that pays into the MCCVB. 75% uh, of the trolley service for this fiscal year in uh, starting uh, in Memorial Day, ending on Labor Day in 22, uh, is paid by the city of Monterey, shoveling, shuttling uh, customers uh, to from Old Monterey to the Fisherman's Wharf, to Canary Row, and to the um, uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium. So again, that's paid by the city of Monterey and uh, it brings uh, customers, paying customers into their business districts. Um, last but not least, uh, and that's often overlooked, often forgotten, uh, to operate uh, 50, 60, 80,000 people in town every single weekend or in summer, even higher numbers, uh, we are staffed to be uh, responding to uh, emergencies or to cover events. Uh, almost every single weekend there are events. And when you look in detail at the overtime budget for the police, uh, there are s large numbers of, of overtime hours that we require from our uh, police officers when, when they are uh, asked to go to Cali routes and uh, ensure that public safety is secured there. Now, in all fairness also, uh, large scale events are reimbursing us for this overtime. So we are not doing this just for free, but we have to have the people there. Um, another element, uh, the beaches have to be cleaned, the parks have to look okay, trails have to be functional, et cetera, et cetera. Big um, point always overlooked is public restrooms. Uh, we have to provide public restrooms. Uh, we have 32 of them and uh, they have to be serviced uh, every single day. And the high impact restrooms have uh, probably four to five times a day service levels there because otherwise they would run out of supplies and they would also not look as clean as they have to be. Again, that supports um, every single one of us, supports the business community and of course, in the end, uh, you will hear, uh, but you get also the sales tax and you get the hotel tax and you get the parking revenues. Absolutely true. Next slide. So we cannot, uh, my suggestion is to, to take the funding away from the business districts. Uh, the business districts are uh, capable to pay the $10,500 for themselves. They can come up with the funding for that. Um, they, what would they do if they have to shed cost? If, if they have a business like the city of Monterey running, they would look at reducing cost where they really have leverage, where they have re really marginal return of investments. Um, for us, uh, recommendation is that's one of those uh, marginal return on investments when you look at uh, funding for the business district. We need to use those saved funds for other city funded activities. Um, Monterey uh, has uh, a program in place to um, help uh, homeless, very highly successful. 
uh, you have businesses that uh, have engaged the council and asked we need to do more for homelessness or have uh, co expressed a concern about homelessness. Uh, we have a team of, of three or four police officers uh, that in essence are working as quasi social workers and are out there day in and day out and helping folks. And I just encourage everyone listening to my presentation tonight, go on to the Maury Police Department website, read their monthly reports. And every month we have a feature that is called John Doe or Jane Doe. And read about this, that uh, what, what we are doing there. These are success stories, uh, sometimes not success stories, but they tell you that uh, we have, after five years, over 300 contacts with individuals, dozens of arrests. We count a success when we get the person into an, uh, a program to help him or her to get sober. And uh, we count it as a success when they have a part-time job. And we count it as a success when they get the first home again. Read those stories. That's what we are doing. We need money to continue doing that. Uh, you will see in our budget that we need to increase custodial cleaning again. Uh, you get complaints of when a restroom is not stocked appropriately from the same businesses and from, from other users as well. We want to fix that. Item six today uh, allocated $25,000 to Hope Services to help with uh, cleaning of the um, uh, uh, trash cans, the litter trash cans that we have that allow you to recycle and also to depose other trash there. Um, again, um, that's money that I think is better spent on, on hope services uh, to, to help the business district and, and us to look cleaner. Uh, and of course, uh, the budget will contain an, a, restore, a restored position, which is the Greenbelt uh, coordinator, which is a person that uh, is working for us to uh, help with uh, green belt maintenance in in the in in the various cities green belts, um, some of them are in the Monte Vista neighborhood. Next slide. And last but not least, uh, what you will see from us is also, and and uh, Rafaela in in her report will highlight that uh, we are bringing back uh, some of the staff uh, that that we feel is is important for us. Uh, we are reinstating positions in the library. Uh, the library is, is back to uh, a $3 million operation. Um, that is almost the pre-funding level of 2019. Now that's an unfair comparison because costs have increased, but it's a $3 million operation with uh, no offsetting revenues. Uh, we're bringing back people in parks and recreation, um, including uh, the sports center. And um, we uh, bring back people in police and a police services technician in, in police. This is not an officer, just a person uh, that helps us with the operation in the back house uh, of, of the police station. Um, we have to adjust salaries and information technology just because our folks are leaving us and going to the next city uh, across the border and uh, make $20,000 more for the same job. So we need to adjust that. We cannot bleed uh, IT people. Uh, we are creating a position in, in, in finance that will help us with additional revenue generation. That's a business license inspector. Uh, we add a fire safety officer into a fire training officer. Council heard a presentation not too long ago by CityGate about um, uh, need of creating this training officer, we are doing that. And we need to bring back um, a chief of planning or a planning manager, uh, because uh, we have a lot of um, requirements, uh, requests by the council. Community development is, is a key department here in the city. And uh, we have to bring back a planning manager just to support the existing planning staff that we have there. Uh, you all know uh, how many of the items that are in front of council are coming from this small group of people. It's not just that they help you with planning applications at the counter. Um, it is uh, also the goal setting and the council priorities for uh, affordable housing and, and other points that are important uh, enough to backfill a position with a senior manager our department had. Uh, needs um, a, a good uh, second uh, person there that can help her. 
we have to reorganize a little bit in human resources. And of course, there's a lot of uh, budget, um, I call it mumbo jumbo, but it's in, in essence um, budget budgetary reallocation and public works where we shovel accounts around a little bit with really not a lot of um, cost impacts. It's, it's more or less a zero sum game. And of course we can explain all that to you in case you want it. Next slide. The question came up uh, not too long ago and I wanted to bring it forward to you as well. Um, council, council stipends have not been adjusted since 1999. Uh, the mayor stipend hasn't been adjusted since 2002. Uh, that's uh, 20 years for, for the mayor and I think quick math here, 23 years for council members. Uh, so the question came up uh, and I bring it forward to the council uh, since uh, I feel this is my duty not to sit on that question. Does, does the council want like to consider in the next, uh, in the very next future also to look at the council, mayor and council stipends? Next slide. So with that, um, I hand it over to our capable finance director, Rafaela King. And uh, Rafaela will, will show you a lot more insights into the numbers and, and you will get a good feel where we are with the overall budget and where, where the numbers uh, will fall. With that, Rafaela, I hope you're ready to roll. I'm ready. Okay, go for it. Okay, good evening, Council Mayor. Um, everyone, um, let's just get started with the citywide um, FY22 23 operating budget. So, this slide here kind of shows you what the operating revenues and expenditures will be. So, they are separated by general fund um, versus all other funds. So, we have operating revenues of 87,000 with transfers in of about 1.1 million and coming up with 88 million for revenues in the general fund. Other funds are uh, funds like all the enterprise funds, internal revenue, and special revenue funds combined and on combined more details in a couple of slides later. So that comes to about 97 million. So the total revenues of the projected citywide is 186 million. Going down to the expenditures, we're looking at general fund expenditures of 89 million with about 1.5 transfers in, coming to 91 million uh, for general fund expenditures for the year. Other funds, again, this um, includes, again, enterprise funds, internal service, special revenue funds, 61 million a transfer out, and then 62 million um, total, leaving the expenditures totals for citywide at 153 million. Next slide. So when balancing the budget, we um, talked about this at the primer a couple of weeks back with um, how we were using one-time enhancements. So what we came up with, we had our proposed expenses are at 91 million, 136.55. We had fund, we have um, a slide with funded reserves at 1.9 million. I have a slide showing those details later. And our total expenses or uses at 93 million, 90,655. So our projected revenues we just saw for a general fund is 88 million, 854, 780. So we looked at having salary savings of about 4%, which came to about 1.7 million, and using an assigned fund balance of 2.4, giving us um, total revenues or sources of 93 million, uh, which actually matches and uses, which is how we balance the um, general fund budget. So looking at the details coming up next from the revenues. So um, our revenues, the general fund revenues, this is separated by type, just to give you where the revenues are coming from, which you can see we have our property taxes coming in at 13.6 million, sales and use at 15 million, a TOT tax at um, 26 million, business license at 3.8, utility users tax at 4 uh, million, and so on. If you look at the fees and charges, that has a total of several um, fees and charges throughout the city of 16 uh, million. Other revenues of 1.5. So we, this is what makes up that 88 million of general revenue. Next slide. So this slide should look familiar to you. We showed this um, at the primer, basically tell you what our, um, out of the 88 million, where our top five generate, revenue generators are. Again, TOT tax makes up 30% of all the general fund revenue. Our sales and use tax comes in at 18% and the fees and charges that we just talked about is 16% and the property taxes also at 16. 
utility uses tax at five percent. So these five these five categories are the top five revenue generators. So we want to always, always be mindful of what uh, those numbers look like because it, it basically provides most of our revenue. Next slide. So moving into the special revenue and agency funds, um, we only wanted to, what I did was I put like the top 10, 11 um, revenues. So the gas tax coming in at 808,000, the neighborhood improvement, we have it at 5 million, just over 5 million. Manaz Hans talked about the 4.9 million we are allocating here. The addition of 400,000 ish comes from interest allocations. Um, then we also have this uh, measure P and S, we're projecting at 11 million. Our um, SB1 road maintenance, 659. Um, low and moderate income asset, 578. Community development block grant, 1.3. Store line maintenance, 2.5. Storm water utility, 1.1. Our conference um, CFD, 4.8. Our library and museum trust funds, those two are combined here at 180,000. Thailand's at 2.6 million and then all the other funds um, combined at 570. So we're looking at total revenue for special revenues and agency funds at 31 million 677,598. So moving into our enterprise and our internal service funds. So our enterprise funds are um, numbers one through five and then our um, internal service funds are six through um, 12. So starting with our enterprise funds, the marina fund, we're projecting 3.2 million, the cemetery fund, 291,000, parking fund, 11.2 million, the presidio, we're looking at 20 million, the Navy service fund at 354,000 coming in. For the internal service funds, the equipment replacement fund at 1.1 million, vehicle maintenance fund, 2.6, our information services fund, 7.3, Workers' comp insurance, 3.9. Uh, liability and property insurance at 3.8. And then our employee benefit fund at 10.7. And all others about 7,500. So we're looking at total enterprise and internal service funds of 65.7 million. So those are the revenues. So let's just talk about the citywide expenses for a minute. So we took the general fund expenditures and broke them down by department. So you can see how the money is um, spread out. So for a city, um, for the mayor's council of mayors, about 131,000 city attorneys, 1.2 million. The city manager's office also includes the city clerk and communications, about 2 million. Community development, 5.3. Conference center, 4.5. Finance, 3.8. Fire comes in at 26 million. Um, human resources at 1 million. Non-departmental is 97,000. The library, 2.9 million. Police, 22 million. Public works, um, 8.3 million. Parks and regs, uh, 12, point, uh, 12 million. So our total expenditures, that's what makes up the 91 million um, that we have here. I do want to say that um, most departments um, with the UAL going up and some of the other expenses that are going up, um, the numbers will look slightly higher. Um, to all department heads once they look at what they put in the budget versus the, uh, the numbers that are allocated between the departments based on the benefits, um, the first liabilities and those kind of things that are allocated and also the internal services for um, for IT equipment, all of those have gone up significantly. So everyone's budget has um, basically gets hit a little harder just like everything else. Next slide, please. So again, this is another slide that you've seen before. So we're looking at um, in general fund, basically our salaries and benefits, um, the cost of doing business, our service, we provide services that um, comes to 76% of our total budget. Um, we have operations and maintenance at 12% and then internal service is about 12%. These are moving target numbers. Again, they are, um, they'll change slightly, but basically the percentages are around uh, are pretty much on target. Next slide. So moving into our special revenue funds, um, these are the expenses. So our gas tax at 20,000, um, neighborhood improvement at 399. These are things that are already projected. Our street infrastructure, which is measure P and our SB road, um, road maintenance, they both are at zero, zero because at zero because 
um, the departments come in as projects come up and they come do it um, separately and um, do it throughout the fiscal year to actually allocate appropriate funds at that point in time. And then we have our um, low and moderate income housing, our CDBG at 1.5, sewer line maintenance at 2.0, um, stormwater utility 1.3, CFD 28,000, um, a library music museum, music, a library museum trust funds at 258. Thailand's at 3.5, all others, but including transfers at 1.9. So total special revenue and um, agencies funds is at 11.5 million. Moving to our enterprise expenses, we have our marina at 2.4, the cemetery at 500,000, parking fund at 8.1, the presidio at 14.9, and the Navy services at 300,000. Then we move down to the um, internal service. The equipment um, replacement, replacement fund is budgeted at 32,000. However, equipment replacement will be appropriated throughout the year as well. Uh, vehicle maintenance fund, 2.7. Information services, 7 million. Workers' comp insurance trust, 450,000. Library liability and property insurance, 4.1 million. Employee benefits, the health benefits, and those things, about 10 million. All others. Um, to about 13,000. So the total for enterprise and internal service funds comes to 51 million 205. It's a change. So I told you I was going to talk about the funded um, reserves. So um, as we talked about earlier in that main year, that we had to put money aside in main year to kind of start putting money away. Um, for the reserves. So starting with economic uncertainty reserve, we put money in there, I think it was about to the tune of about 1.4 million at mid-year, and that was to get it up to 18%, which is at this point, it's a good thing that we did because right now what we're looking at just to maintain 16.6%, we have to put an additional 200,000 on top of what we did at mid-year just to maintain 16% for, um, throughout the 23 fiscal year. We keep our um, left the number in here, 750,000 for capital projects. Um, encumbrances, um, we still have some purchase orders that are um, we expect to close out that will free up um, some money. So we're looking at about 850,000, which kind of helps to offset some of these reserves that we're um, here, basically kind of reclassing them from one right to another. We also are putting money away again, another million dollars in the pension reserve to attack that. Um, Unfunded liability, conference center reserves 250, sports center reserve for um, 250, technology and additional 250, and then other facilities 100,000. So that total is one uh, 1.9 million. So moving into the personnel, just changes. Um, I'm have them separated here just by department just to kind of show you exactly. I left all numbers out just to kind of get so we can concentrate just on the position themselves. So in community development, we are adding a planning manager, adjusting salary for property manager, deleting a part-time administrative assistant, and then adding a regular, um, a regular part-time marketing administrative assistant position. Finance department, we have um, cleanup, we have any um, for rest. Executive assistant, we had at one point 25% of that position funded in risk management. Now 100% will be funded in the finance department. So that's just suggesting that we're adding a business license inspector with a three year trial period just to see. Um, so we can get, basically go out of the community and try and recoup some income that we're using from business license. So getting a business inspector out there to um, recoup some information, some revenues. Um, reclassing two senior accountants to finance managers. Next slide. And for the fire department, Hans talked about earlier, the training. So we're adding a division chief training. Human resources, we are um, deleting the deputy, basically reclassing the deputy human resources manager and adding assistant HR director. Delete a HR analyst and add um, HR coordinator. And then to take place at mid year, deleting two HR specialists and adding two HR coordinators. Next slide. And for the information services division, again, Hans talked about this one in detail a little earlier. We're deleting one IT specialist and adding a senior IT specialist 
deleting three information um, IT analysts and adding three IT application engineer two positions. For the library, we're adding a full time librarian, um, adding two library assistants to and deleting two. Um, library assistance to RPT positions. Some of those funds will be uh, RPT positions. The difference will be paid for by some funds coming from um, various sources in the um, library trust. So it won't be 100% funded by general fund, but there is some subsidies coming from those. Parks and Recreation Department, we're adding a um, park maintenance lead worker and the Greenbelt coordinator and also the recreation specialist. Police departments adding police service technician. Public works, there's about three slides of public works. The first one we listed the additions to the general fund, starting with an associate mechanical engineer, an engineer, project manager, three custodians, a senior custodian, and a lead custodian, and the leading from general fund facility attendant. And then there's also a reclass from the general fund to other funds. There's a park maintenance worker going from we're going from the general fund to the parking fund and a building maintenance crafts worker from the general fund to the presidio fund. And then we're reclassing others from other funds to the general fund. The accounting specialist is coming from the uh, parking fund and going to the general fund. So this is a total for the presidio fund. Um, we are adding an HVAC senior tech, adding an administrative assistant, adding an engineer project manager and deleting a parks clerk quality control inspector, senior crafts worker, administrative assistant RPT, uh, public works inspector, and park maintenance worker all day. And then under the vehicle maintenance fund, we are adding an administrative assistant and deleting a field assistant. And then risk management, deleting an analyst and adding a risk manager. And so circling back, that is the end of um, the personnel issue. So circling back to the CM's recommendations, which was the first one, the rec recommendation number one in CIP is the council is to ask to consider the, to allocate the $2 million of available 4.96 um, in CIP funding towards the sports center. The recommendation number two was to suspend funding for the business districts. And recommendation number three was to provide feedback and get out the suggested staff. And that is the end of our presentation. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Did you want us to have a concluding remarks there, uh, Hans, before we ask questions? Well, uh, I think what, what, what this budget will accomplish is that it is a, a budget that is somewhat optimistic because um, our, our numbers uh, that, that we are uh, projecting are based on um, very, very as far as we know, solid folks that are helping us for years and in projecting data points. Uh, they are within the city and they are also outside of the city. So we have a good feel for uh, the major areas that, that Rafaela showed you, the, the, the top five revenue makers. So we, we, we think we have that pretty much under control. And what you what we don't know is uh, what we shared with you with respect to the global outlook or the impact that inflation may have and other factors. Uh, we have to balance the budget by putting in two point five million dollars of unassigned balance. Uh, if we wouldn't do that, we we wouldn't have the budget in front of you tonight, uh, at least not with uh, with all the. Um, points that we just presented. So I, I think uh, overall, uh, we will have um, a good budget uh, should it be approved. Uh, we were struggling in, in some areas. We shared that with you tonight. Um, and we're looking forward to your questions. And, and hopefully we have all the answers. Should we not have the answers, we will strive to bring them forward to you in, in, in two weeks. So um, I know it was a long presentation. Uh, but I think it's it's uh, if we talk about 153 million dollars, um, it warrants a, a little lengthier presentation. Yes, without question. Uh, historically, in my experience, uh, we we would adopt budgets every year. Probably, probably, argumentably, 
arguably the uh, most important thing we do because without a budget, none of the great programs from homeless services to housing, safety, uh, recreation, et cetera. None of that happens if you don't have a budget to pay for it. It's, uh, so it's certainly worth taking the time. So this evening, I think you would like to hear from the public and the city council um, about the three particular recommendations that you made. Again, with the understanding, no final decision this evening. So I think what we, we should do right now is to have uh, questions from the council. <clears throat> questions only, please, because I'm sure we all have comments and direction. Hear from the public, then we'll come back for council deliberations and direction to our fine staff. <clears throat> we'll start with Council Member Allen with questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've got three questions. Mm -hmm. The first one had to do with the percentage of our budget that um, we spend on personnel. Raphael, I think you said it was about 76%. And I'm just wondering how that compares kind of statewide. Is that low? Is it high? Is it average? Um, for schools, that would be low. Um, typically, schools would spend closer to 84, 85% of their budgets on personnel. So that's kind of why that stood out to me. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that. My experience has been that that's a little high for a city. Um, I've been typically, for most cities that I've contracted to go and work with, um, we're pretty much in like the high 60, 66, 67%. So it's a little, okay. for me, it's a little high. Okay, thank you. But let me um, explain. Let me explain okay, this go a ahead. little bit sure. more, uh, because um, um, also to 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 not contradict the finance director, but of course to to highlight that our contractual workforce on the presidio that, uh, as we saw, uh, brings uh, in about twenty million dollars in 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 revenues. Their budgeted presidio funded twenty million dollars is considerably consisting out of thirty five to forty five employees. City of Monterey Fire Department is the fire department uh, for uh, the airport district for the city of Pacific Grove and the city of Carmel, um, as well as contractual workforce for, for Sand City. Uh, we have three more fire stations than we need to have. So uh, the 76% that we are in personnel is, I think, that smack where we need to be with respect to all the service levels that we are providing. So um, I want to add that additional information to that because uh, as a contracting agency for the Presidio of Monterey as well as for neighboring agencies that comes back with additional staffing levels. The contracts with PG and Carmel are $6.6 .6 million each uh, in, in fire services. So um, that brings the personal numbers up to 76%. Thank, thank you, Hans. So kind of just to distill that, even though we spend more on personnel, some of those areas are generating revenue that other cities wouldn't see. So we're generating revenue from our fire contracts, we're generating revenue from our contracts with the Presidio. Okay, got it. Second question, and this kind of is related to that, had to do with the enterprise funds. And I'm just wondering, um, are all of the all of the enterprise funds essentially self-sustaining, or are there any of them that are requiring subsidy from the city general fund? The one that comes to mind for me is the cemetery, um, and it also came up during the audit. Um, that that's one that we really need to be looking at, um, probably folding into the general fund because that one. It's not self-sustaining. That's the only one that just sticks out in the mind. Hey, thank you very much. And the last question had to do with the conference center. And I heard very clearly from the city manager about the importance of the, the dehumidifier system. And I think all of us who've ever had to deal with water issues in our home understand why that would be so important. Um, so the $2 million figure that, we're, that that staff has kind of floated, I guess I'm wondering if somebody could drill down into that a little bit, a bit. how much of that is needed, let's say specifically for that dehumidifier system, how much of it is needed for other kind of infrastructure repairs in the sports center? Thanks. So in, that's in the sports center, good. Well, yeah. let's, uh, Hans, 
could, could we uh yeah, I, um, Steve Whitry is online as well, our celebrated public works director from the oh, South. Oh, I like that. Um, but um, the dehumidifier is estimated uh, from our team at $1.2 million. We have um, an actual cost proposal also from a consulting engineering company that is a little bit darker than, than 1.2. It actually goes for $1.4 million. Mm. We think um, that uh, they are uh, in some areas slightly overestimating that. Uh, so the dehumidifier is is probably very well estimated at about uh, 1.2 million with, with a real um, detailed cost estimation behind it. Um, we have two or three other large scale items there that, that cost money. One is, uh, as I pointed out, the water slide. Uh, we, we try to get away with maybe um, uh, a cost efficient uh, repair of of just the staircase that may be not as expensive than the whole replacement of the water slide. So the numbers there are <clears throat> two to three hundred thousand uh, dollars. We have to um, work in the netatorium with respect to painting it. That's about hundred thousand uh, dollars, and also the plastering of the pool, Steve. I, I don't know if I have the number correct right now, but it's something like three hundred thousand dollars. Um, if you look at the pool right now, uh, it, it looks quite nice, but you can see in some areas some sort of the water not as clear as it should be. That's because we have uh, we have to fix the, the, the plaster in the pool. Uh, then there is also the pool doors are rusting away. We have to replace the, the, those. And last but not least, uh, in the natatorium, the wainscoting has to be fixed as well. So. All in all, that adds up to um, more than, I believe, $2 million. Stephen, if I forgot anything, please, uh, of course, correct me. No, you're pretty close, Hans, pretty spot on. Uh, there's a couple little nits, but uh, pretty spot on. Uh, okay, thanks. thanks, that's it. Could I follow on with a question Alan had here? Yeah, sure, why don't you go ahead, uh, Ed, yeah, we could make I this. A, yeah. to relate on the question for the uh, capital improvement for the uh, sports center, uh, the big ticket item of 1.2, and then of course the pool and the stairs. What's the life of the previous mm -hmm. equipment that was there? I mean, how long did the stairs last? How long did that dehumidifier stay in that building? Are those original or are we looking at, we've replaced them already? So I just celebrated my 25 year anniversary with the city last week. Thank you all those who remembered that. Um, it's, it's for me the second time that we replaced the dehumidifier. So when I started in 97, uh, we were on the first dehumidifier that was basically installed when the city opened the uh, sports center in 92. Uh, so this will be the second dehumidifier that, that I see being replaced. So make the math, it's they last anywhere a little bit over 10, 12 years or so. Yeah. Uh, the, um, the slide, we had a major repair there during my time in public works as well. Uh, it was also very expensive because the slide again is a metal structure and it's rotting away in the, in the moisture there. So for me, it's the second time that we will replace or repair the staircase there while I'm in the city. So it's probably de facto the second time that we do something there. Okay, great, thank you very much. That's an interesting when we uh, we developed the sports center. The slide was discussed at that time, and and we thought uh, the council at that time thought it would be a good attraction, and so it cost fifty thousand dollars. And we debated that and debated that, and now you can't even fix the stairs for fifty thousand, right? So there you go, uh, council member Dan. Sorry, I had to throw a little antidote in there. Well, thank thank goodness you didn't approve a sixty meter pool either. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we'd be we'd be repairing a lot if we had. There that. you go. Oh boy. Okay, I have uh, three questions or four questions. Uh, one of them was uh, what Alan already uh, discussed was a, was about the uh, the salaries and benefits. So you're right, Alan. It's about eighty two to eighty five percent in education. So. When I saw 76, I said, wow, that's great. I thought that was pretty good, actually. Um, I've got a couple of questions um, for Rafaela. Uh, one is, um, 
Uh, in the enterprise funds, revenue versus expenditures is do, do the departments spend expenditures, the amount of revenue they bring in, or do we, um, or do we anticipate that we will uh, have a uh, carryover for each one of those funds? How, I guess what I'm saying is, how do they budget their expenditures? They would budget the expenditures the same way as a general fund, except they are pretty much um, proprietary funds, so they operate just like um, for profit. So they right. can still they can use you know they can budget with what they basically what they have in the bank, whatever their um, retained earnings are, they can budget those as well to move forward. Are they given a goal of what they need to um, to fall out at the end of the year, or or is it just whatever you spend, whatever the revenue comes in, and we. We, the delta is uh, what goes into your fund. Actually, it's it's based. We don't for those enterprise funds. We don't give them say, hey, you have, you know, three percent or here's your base. We let them, you know, because they're different project based and they're all different based on whatever projects and and um, things they have to do, like parking. If they're um, installing the new parking meters or whatever, so we don't um, tell them. Basically, you have X amount. We just basically kind of say, "This is what you, what your balance is." They'll ask for what is our balance um, in the funds, and they'll take in what their projected revenues are, and they'll they can uh, allocate all of that. Well, let's hope it makes money. It, it sounds yes. like a it sounds like it does. Uh, thank you. Um, and this probably is more appropriate to Steve uh, than than Raffaella, but um, we are deleting positions in the public works department. In those deletions, Steve, um, who assumes the responsibilities of those positions that are deleted? So it's a little bit of a restructuring that's going on out there as some of the positions, for example, we have an engineering project manager position and, and, and it's really not an, an addition, so to speak. It's kind of the zero sum game Hans was talking about. On the position control list, this is something that I had brought up as, as an idea is we have a difficult time bringing engineers into the fold, licensed engineers. So that engineering project manager position would be a position that could perform work that's not licensed, but we come into that same level as a different way to accomplish the project. So in the position control list, we're not really adding, it's kind of a wash because it's either the engineer that we're able to hire or the project control manager for, as an example on that one. We do have some cleanup, I think, to do in the in the building maintenance uh, division. Uh, we, we have a little bit of a challenge there that we have to go through with a little bit more of a fine tooth comb. So there's some things on that aspect that we just do need to clean up just a little bit. But overall, it's more of a restructuring and re looking at how those those different areas can function better and more efficiently with 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 staff that we have. Okay, that makes sense, Steve. Thank you very much. And then my last question, the more difficult questions for the city manager. Um, uh, you talked about the business district funding, and then you made a, a comment about a marginal return of investment. Well, Hans, what does that mean, marginal return of investment, and how do you determine whether it's a marginal return of investment? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, that was in the context of um, when you have to shed cost uh, uh, because you you are not having sufficient funding in place to to keep your business, your core business going, like the city has not sufficient funding in place for to have the core business going, you as a business look at, okay, what are my uh, abilities? What are my possibilities to cut back on cost? And uh, here I, I uh, submit for, for, for your consideration to say $10,200 to a business district are not a smart investment by the city. Uh, because in the end, it does not have really an impact on the sales tax or in the parking revenues for the city of Monterey. Um, as a matter of fact, I think that uh, all the other impacts that, that we are funding already, and I pointed them out to you in the millions of dollars, have probably the, the biggest effect on that. And uh, when I look at, at our own city as a business, which we have to do because our businesses always remind us, look at yourself as a business, uh, we have to look at, at those things. And, and so uh, if we want to continue funding other elements that are benefiting the businesses, and I pointed out to you, police, uh, safety, uh, uh, park maintenance, trail maintenance, uh, custodial cleaning of the restrooms, 
I, uh, I suggest uh, very strongly to take the $10,500 per, uh, per business district away and leave that in the city coffers. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Hans. That's it, Mayor, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Dan. I'm Mayor Dan. I'm going back to your dad, huh? I know. 20 years. It happens, it happens a lot. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've got, I'll tell you, there's a fun story that has to do with that. That's, uh, but, <laughs> so uh, questions, uh, other council members? Um, we could, well, obviously we're able to have more questions and discussion after the public. Yeah, I've, uh, Mayor, I've already had my, my turn. I do have one more question. I think Tyler- No, no, go ahead, yeah. Okay. For Raffaella, um, on one of your slides, Raffaella, you talked about special revenue sources. And it was the, I think it was uh, on one of the slides, item number three, street infrastructure, and you listed measure P, measure S as the revenue sources. Um, and, I, and I think that was a total fund of about $11 million, which included gas tax from uh, California, uh, the STIP fund. So is that also including uh, the funds that come in for measure X? So we have funds that come in annually from Measure X from the Monterey County Tax Initiative through TAMSI. Is that in that section? That is a wonderful question. And I do not remember what fund Measure X is specifically in. I will get back to you on that. Okay, yeah. so I, I imagine it's part I of the tool, but- I just, might help. Uh, Measure X is a separate funding source. It, it is probably a little over a million dollars coming to us. Uh, Measure P and S is, is are the numbers that, that uh, Rafaela shared and the gas tax, uh, I believe is something uh, of $880,000. So uh, Measure X is a separate allocation through TAMSI. Okay, and then of course, I know it gets spent through the public works on initiatives that are very valuable to the community. So I just wanted to highlight that maybe we, we will start listing that in future years so we know the Measure X that the voters voted for um, five eight cent sales tax. Uh, that was the only questions I had right now of uh, staff. Okay, Council Member Tyler, questions? Yeah, so I wanted to start off and just check in about the um, actual budget packet. Um, I'm not sure if that's already been established and just hasn't been posted yet, or um, maybe when can we expect to see that? Because it's it's hard for me to fully understand um, what's going on here by just the uh, the staff report and in the slides that were presented today. So I'm just wondering what that looks like and, and when can we anticipate being able to view that? The target date is... Um... Target date is the 16th. So, we'll, so the council will have five days to review that before we actually have to approve this budget. I just kind of wanted to kind of paint the reality. And this isn't just the council, this is also the public being able to have time to, to come through this and being able to analyze it. I've given feedback on this in the past. And I, I guess I won't go too much into my comments at this point, but um, um, I guess as a follow-up to this, do we anticipate going back to the biannual budget starting next fiscal year? That's a city manager decision. So, so um, biannual budget need to allow you to give some planning security uh, and we are not in that environment right now. We actually wanted a biannual budget for this fiscal year and uh, for about two, three, four weeks, we're in the mode go biannual. And then uh, events just took over and we go the safe route right now with an annual. Um, also, just, just to clarify your, your previous uh, expressed uh, concerns, uh, the council uh, budget package uh, is usually always presented on the night when the council is approving the budget, but you have actually uh, if you like in another week, uh, uh, if you feel you need to study the topic more, uh, you will have uh, an opportunity to uh, after June 21st to go into another special meeting on June 28th and uh, provide us with your analysis and your feedback then as well. So it's, it's the council's pleasure, but we are not really deviating from the usual 
uh, style how we are, pre are presenting numbers. So uh, I hope that helps. Uh, we, you have the opportunity, if you would like to do so, to uh, in depth uh, go into the budget and, and um, uh, ask questions and make suggestions and provide input. Okay, and then um, thank you for that. And then um, there was mention of us helping with the next year's budget shortfall um, by additional funding in our surplus being available beyond um, what we had allocated in March for the rainy day funds. What was that delta between what we were anticipating in March versus what we see now um, that's going towards next year's budget? What we saw in, in March, we believe it was about six million and we thought we were gonna have additional. So what we've done is, um, you know, most half, at least part of that was actually put into the reserves. And we took um, about 2.5 million is what we took from that to actually close the budget gap this year. So we still, everything that we've done, we're still making sure that we kind of leave some a buffer mm -hmm. into unfunded. So it's for just in case anything happens, um, any unsurpri surprises or anything comes up next year. So um, there's still going to be about 2.5 sitting there um, for other things. Like we know there's a, um, a couple of projects and a couple of um, vehicles and things that needs to be done that are not um, budgeted for now that we're expected to have. So, does that answer or? So, so, so 2.5 million is what we're anticipating taking from this year's budget to support next year's budget? Yes. Okay, yep, that, that, thank you, that does. Um, and then um, I just have a question. When Rick Johnson spoke earlier, he was identifying that for the bids, the business improvement districts, that there's a cap on how much the businesses can be charged. I just wanted to kind of validate that statement with staff um, because it, it, if that's true, then it conflicts with the statement in the staff report that identifies that the business districts can make up their delta um, from what the city may end up not supporting by increasing what they charge themselves. So I just kind of wanted to get some clarity from staff on that. I, I will ask uh, Rick Johnson to explain it because I cannot explain that. Uh, Kim, can you explain it because you got online? Go ahead, Kim. I'm sure I'm happy to help. Um, so each business improvement district as they um, were created the businesses came forth with their assessment levels and it varies by business district. So for example, the Cannery Row Business Improvement District proposed to assess their businesses 100% of their business license um, with the exception of offices. Um, other business districts um, only cho or chose to assess themselves 25%. So it goes back to the foundation document of um, how that business improvement district was funded. And that was based on uh, basically a, a consensus effort by the businesses to figure out how they will assess themselves. So as a follow up, and I'm sure Tyler's thinking the same thing, it, the associations, the business associations themselves would change their bylaws, so to speak, change their assessment level. They could, and they could do that on an annual basis. So that's what the levy of assessment is about. The business uh, improvement district submits their annual report and their proposal for how they're going to assess themselves. Mm -hmm. And that was what happened at the meeting in May. And then the meeting in June is the actual levy of assessment. So if they're going to change that assessment, then that has to be um, proposed by the businesses that are assessing themselves. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that is all my questions for now. So, okay, uh, and thank you, Councilman uh, Tyler. Uh, my question would go back to the Moderate Sports Center and 
that's the capitalization in hindsight, Monday morning quarterbacking, right? Uh, obviously for, for CIP, the, the cities, everybody just needs to put money aside when you have to repair something at your home or your apartment, your car, whatever. And so last year, the city council at the recommendation of Parks and Rec Commission did create a maintenance and renewal surcharge on recreation fees. So Hans, would you review what we expect to get from that? I think we were talking of possibly a million dollars a year, which would go for maintenance and renewal, which could be used for the sports center. And then how are we looking on that so far? How much have we collected? And if you don't have that answer tonight, that's okay. But to me, that, that's an example of what we need to do. So we don't have to, for example, on a conference center, we don't have to go out and float bonds. And I know all the major businesses, hotels, et cetera, they're all capitalizing. And that's something the city has to do in the new normal. So how are we doing on that fee? So, so that fee is collected based on the number of uh, programs that are being purchased by our users. And uh, as, as, a, as we discussed, um, the, the numbers of customers returning is pretty low. Mm -hmm. uh, we estimate the initial fee rec uh, that, uh, that we would collect uh, out of that maintenance facility fee, which is 5% on top of uh, the uh, set recreation fees for the first year was something around $300,000. Yes, and hopefully as we have more people going back to the sports center, which is the major revenue generator, uh, that fee would increase. All right, so council, would you like to go to public comment now or take a break and come back for public comment? What's your thought? How's, how's everybody doing? We're pushing two hours. Why don't, let's take a break and come back in about 11 minutes, nine, right? I think we should. I, I don't like to sit more than some meetings go for. Uh, we'll be back in about 10 minutes. Okay, <laughs> let's take a little break and we'll go to public comment.
we're back. <laughs> I enjoyed that little break, so I hope you all did as well. And I, I once again want to thank uh, Rafaela and Hans, Kim, the whole staff. It's a whole staff effort to put this together. And I was just at a uh, Eagle Scout ceremony and one of the uh, sco uh, Scout laws is bravery. And being brave to put things forward. And when you know that's the right thing that you wanna do, and, and even though maybe it's not the most popular thing to do. And so there are probably things in this budget that took uh, bravery to put on the table, but we appreciate that. And of course, ultimately the council, after all the input, will decide which way we wanna go. So well, one of the adjectives that I'm gonna to put to my list is be brave. And thank you for being so brave staff for, pointing out what's going on and also we we realize that we've had several really thorough briefings on the budget although as our friend uh, council member tyler said there's nothing like getting it in your hands and going through with a fine tooth comb and so and we'll be looking at this uh, many of these items that are budgeted will come back to the city council in the future for individual action uh, anytime you're looking at uh, igsa the intergovernmental intergovernment uh, service agreement with the Presidio, all of those, all the capital improvements, uh, the Measure S, uh, Measure P, all of those expenditures do come back. So a budget is, is a large look, but as Rafaela said so so well, pretty much uh, very some, but not a whole lot. So at this point, we really would uh, appreciate hearing from the public. And what we're gonna do is, from what I can see from participants online that we have four hands raised so far. And then I'm sure we're gonna have some folks in the council chambers and I can see you all. Thank you for being there. These hybrid meetings have some advantages and disadvantages. It would be nice if we could all be together, but uh, Monterey County has now hit high infection rates. So we just have to be careful. So we wanna hear from everyone. And so I think what we'll do, let's go ahead and start with, uh, we have seven hands, thank you. Let's go ahead and start with our online attendees. Then we'll go to the council chamber. Then we'll take that public comment. Then we'll bring it back to the council for direction specifically on the recommendations. There were three that the city manager at this point wants direction on. And obviously when we get to the, the final adoption, we can make other changes at that time. We will do three minutes, but just would advise everyone that you don't need it, you don't need it. If you agree with somebody else, you can say that because um, we're probably not even gonna be getting to our discussion until well after 10 o'clock. Kind of a tough time to start talking about a $153 million budget. So with that, we certainly welcome your input and. Clementine, I think you take care of our online guests. So let's have them go ahead, please. Yes, we have our first comment from Jean Rash. Thank you. I'm Jean Rash, a resident of Monterey Vista neighborhood and the president of the Monterey Vista Neighborhood Association and the NCIP rep. Uh, thank you for those very good presentations. Thank you, Mr. Usler, for acknowledging that we did receive $6.47 million from the American Rescue Plan, not nothing as was insinuated earlier. I ask that you not take the $2 million from NCIP. If I had the privilege of being on the city council, what I would do is I would delay putting $1 million into the pension reserve and I would reach back into the $2 million that mid-year were reserved, were reserved set-asides for IT. Both of those topics are important. Reserves are important. We should have been doing that prudently year by year. We didn't. But going back to Mr. Usler's analogy of the impoverished family, if the baby doesn't have whole milk for her Cheerios, you don't put a million dollars away for the college fund, you buy your milk. And the same should be true for the NCIP program. From the point of view 
of an NCIP representative. I've been seven years, three as an alternate, four now as a rep. You have reached in, in my interpretation, for six years. Now, why to the funds? Why do I say that? Because in 2020, the council deappropriated $9.3 million. That's three years of projects. But those are projects which were never touched, they were never begun, they were delayed, they were ignored, they were not popular to staff. And that's a, that was a chronic irritation to the members of the NCIP committee who, who just didn't understand why projects were so ignored unless they were made with cement. So from the point of view, you got the 9.3, then you paused the 20, what we call the 2021 year, and then you paused the 21-22. So that's five years. Now you want 2 million from the sixth year. I fear that it will be the demise of NCIP. You will not have those great volunteers willing to, to waste seven years um, with chronically under done projects, ignored projects, and now defunded projects and defunded NCIP projects. Um, I, I really, we have done our fair share. NCIP has done its fair share. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. And next we have Rick Hoyer. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I'm Rick Hoyer. I'm gonna be speaking first as president of NIP excuse me, chair of NIP. <laughs> uh, when NIP was on the ballot and funded, the forfeit vote was intended to be for fiscal emergencies to be declared to take funding. What is being proposed here is not a fiscal emergency. You've already said you're balancing the budget. Now, that said, does not mean the sports center doesn't need repairs. We also haven't had anyone from the city explaining any of those repairs that were proposed as a project. We were just given a big list, vote on this. No reasons, no reasons for the urgency or anything else. Have the NIP do its job and you know, and over the years we've spent more, maybe as much if not more than CIP on fixes to the sports center. And over 10 years ago, when we started having to replace things that were already breaking down, we said to the council then, you need to start doing and putting away money from every admission into a fund for replacement. It only took you nine or 10 years to get around to doing it. So it hasn't been urgent up until now, and now all of a sudden it is. Now I'm gonna speak as president of the Monterey Peninsula Taxpayers Association. Last year, you all did two tax increases that were supposedly going to solve your problems. I guess the question is the public needs to understand where that money's gone since it obviously didn't solve the problems. And one area that stands out like a sore thumb is when you look at Transparent California, which shows total compensation amounts for employees, 113 Monterey City employees make through total compensation over 200,000 a year, including two that make over 400,000 a year. It does not sit well for the public when you start crying poor and you have that many people making that much money. Now, we're as an organization, we were promised things like overtime and others were gonna be taken care of. It doesn't look like there's been any movement on that. And you've got a structural deficit you have to deal with and you need to get total compensation of employees under control. 113 people over $200,000, 28 over 300,000 is, way too much. No one in the public private sector on this peninsula has that level of a payroll. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you and next we have Kurt Tipton. Hi, Mayor and council members. Thank you for taking our public input. I am Kurt Tipton. I'm the president of the Downtown Neighborhood Association and I also serve on the NCIP committee. I did send you a letter, mm -hmm. but I wanted to ask a few questions if I can. Hans mentioned that for $60,000, they could repair the humidifier. If that's the case, he said he didn't understand it or didn't know how long it would last. 
<clears throat> if it lasts two years, your new funding would be able to replace that. So perhaps it would be a wiser choice to have NCIP fund, possibly fund the repair rather than the whole uh, replacement. The next issue is consider what will happen if you do defund NCIP by $2 million. If you look at our current projects and look at just safety issues, traffic study, <clears throat> radar signs, pedestrian crosswalk improvements, flood control up in Veterans Park, we're already spent the money that's allocated. So by taking away $2 million, you are taking away many safety projects that the community wants. So I agree also with, with what Jean was saying, that these projects were have been on the books, many of them, for quite some time. And the public has, I, I get it all the time, asking when is it gonna be done? Why do we have to go through this again? Obviously the answer was the pandemic, but realize that if council takes away the money, you are again, funding essentially a lot of those projects again. So thank you. Oh. Thank, thank you, Kurt. We did get your email. It was distributed to the council. Um, and staff. Next, we have a telephone caller with the last three digits, 185. So please go ahead, 185. Good evening, Hi. Mr. Mayor and Council. This is Mike Brassfield. Um, I've been listening to your great report from staff and the comments made so far. Um, for the last couple of years, we've taken from NCIP, uh, but there were some commitments made that the projects, some of the project were outstanding, would be completed. So I understand it now we're about four engineers down mm -hmm. and those projects haven't been completed. Now you're looking at a program, which I dearly love um, for its commitment to the neighborhoods, but I don't see that, that the staff can meet the previous projects, let alone any new ones in the timelines that we've established here. We also, the city of modern aid now has been at deficit spending now for years. And I understand that it's probably gonna be two or three more. I think that's time that if we sat around a table like a family and tried to decide what percentage of our budget we could find to make up expenses, we would say that we need to get down to the, the nitty gritty. I've gone through severe budget restrictions where we took out multiple millions of dollars and had the heartache of watching it cut into personnel. Mm -hmm. But if we are at this point, I believe that the council seriously needs to look at a financial crisis and utilize all those funds that you can. And I, I see in the presentation that there was some discussion about taking a hundred thousand, about a hundred thousand dollars. That's separating pepper from fly spec here, and I, we don't have time for that. If we do have to make fiscal responsibility, then you're going to have to make the hard decisions, and that cuts into the cities as in the heart of the city. But we can't continue to do these financial crises every year. I wish you the best of luck. Good night. Thank you, Mike. Okay, uh, next we have someone, I believe this may be Mr. Rowley. This uh, telephone caller, there we go. Please go ahead. Yeah, good evening, uh, Tom Rowley. Uh, Happen to be president of the Fisherman's Flats uh, uh, Homeowners and Residents Association, but I also wear a lot of other hats with the sanctuary. Uh, I'm also vice president of the 
Monterey Peninsula Taxpayers Association. I second the remarks of our president, Rick Hoyer, about some of the promises were made to cut back on future expenses. And quite frankly, I am really severely, severely disappointed in the presentation that was given by Hans earlier today. Uh, the fact that you have again looked to the NCIP fund as your slush fund. It is not a slush fund. There are projects we've gone through. We started with over 200 projects. I believe we're down to 150. As, as Kurt Timpton mentioned, many of these are safety projects that cannot be delayed. The cost keeps going up and it's escalating like the cost on everything. It was mentioned about the cost of the dehumidifier going from 50,000 to where it's over a million. This is what we were facing at NIP. One of the things that surprised us was when the doctor from CHOMP showed up and said, well, we want 1.9 million for all the expenses at the sports center. The parks and rec department was just not on their toes to come in with a priority list of what they wanted to come in and have supporters lobby for the whole up to $2 million was just ridiculous. Some of us said we wanted to, and it was the consensus of the committee at the meeting last week that we hoped that the Parks and Rec would come back with some kind of priorita prioritized list. The, 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 the disappointment at the committee as a whole is just, um, this is probably one of the worst years to be promised that we are finally going to be able to get at the list of key projects, we knew we were gonna be short of funds and not have enough money to cover it. I like to suggest that you take 2 million from your 16% uh, emergency fund, use it as collateral and borrow the 2 million and get the sports center fixed once and for all, then pay it back over the future years. So anyway, um, that's about it. I'm very, very severely disappointed with the performance of the city manager and the, and the city council to listen to this presentation that was given this morning, where you're using NCIP as a tr as a slush fund. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. And let's see. Next, we have um, telephone caller with the last three digits five zero zero. Hello. Um, thank you for the informative presentations. I'm Wendy Brickman, and I'm calling in on behalf of the North Fremont Business District and Fisherman's Wharf Association and the other business districts. And we very much appreciate the bid funding for all the districts and the advertising reimbursements for Fisherman's Wharf Associations. What I'd like to say is the districts are revenue generators for the city, for sales tax, for TOT. North Fremont has 17 hotels for parking revenue. We take the investments and bring in more revenue to the city and the businesses and the public benefits. This is not marginal ROI. I feel that this is really the wrong time to suspend this investment by the city. In fact, I would urge the city to continue as it brings in you know, significant money to the city and helps your budget. It also makes a difference in terms of helping some of the businesses survive and others um, prosper, helping to make up the losses they've experienced over the past few years. And most of them are not enjoying cost of living increases. Although restaurant and hotel revenues are very important, TOT revenues are returning in part to pre-pandemic levels, the expenses of these businesses are far, far, far higher. So their net profits are not as robust due to food costs, for example, for restaurants, employee costs, supply chain challenges and much more. For the North Fremont Business District, this is an area where the businesses definitely need the advertising support. The association provides in its co-op advertising and PR campaigns, bringing in, again, more sales to the city, more recognition and branding, and the businesses. In terms of the city's reimbursement of some of the advertising costs for Fisherman's Wharf Association, it's also different because the city owns the wharf and it's a true direct partner in its success. Increased sales tax and waterfront parking lot revenues directly help the city of Monterey. The city's investment in the wharf, a top attraction in Monterey County is crucial so that we can continue to hold many events that attract both locals and visitors to the city of Monterey, as opposed to attracting them to other cities on the Monterey Peninsula. For the 
Worf, I feel that the Thailand funds can easily fund the $25,000 Worf investment that you give us. If we don't have the funding, we can't create the events that have been very, very successful, not only in attendance, but with valuable publicity throughout the region to draw more visitors as well and increase the sales tax and parking revenue. So I urge you to please continue to fund the business districts and the wharf. I'll conclude by saying our success is your success. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. <clears throat> mm -hmm. All right, next we have Richard Russello. Richard. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. <clears throat> uh, I wanna put my comments on basic economics and and as the mayor knows, and some of the council members, I predicted this crisis a year ago, and I've been trying to avoid these consequences, and I'm disappointed that NCIP wasn't notified of this earlier. But right now, my main concern is not this budget that ends in two weeks. It's Christmas this year, 2022. Your chart shows that we are going to have a $3.7 million deficit. And that from now to Christmas is $20,000 a day we're losing. Why aren't we addressing the deficit this year instead of infrastructure? It's both important, but number one priority is the deficit. So I'm focusing on that. In addition, the chart shows that we have a deficit that ranges from 2 million to 4 million for the next five years. That's where my focus is, to keep the city of Monterey operating, not firing police and firemen. Uh, uh, the world has changed permanently. We have a revenue model failure. 40 years ago, when I started studying the budget in Monterey, we had a three-legged financial stool. That was TOT, the fishing industry, and the military. Well, one leg, the fishing, is gone. The TOT one is broken, and we're trying to sit on a one-legged stool with one broken leg. Uh, we need to reevaluate how we're marketing the city and how we're, our revenue model. It's broken. So nowhere in the budget did I see a mention of a recession? The recession is already in place, but it's tied with uh, rapid inflation, labor shortages, and supply chains. Uh, we got 173 million in obligation to PERS, 15 million this year payment. The stock market dropped next year. What is that payment going to be? Uh, the residents already approved $100 million in infrastructure. At some point, we got to reevaluate our spending and the way we do business. Infrastructure is second, deficits are first. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Richard. Great. Thank you. Next, Mike Sovereign. Thank you. Um, Mayor and City Council, I'm a 50-year resident member of the city's Museum and Cultural Arts Commission. I'm greatly distressed that the city staff's budget leaves the museums without continuity and direction in the coming year. The commission, appointed by the city council, sent a detailed letter on April 7th to the city council in accordance with our city code mission to make recommendations to the city council regarding the development and improvement of the city's museum. This letter has been unanswered, unanswered. Informally, I have been told the city manager does not think that the letter was in compliance with the commission's duties. Does the council agree? If we can't dialogue on the staffing or budget for the museum, what use are we? I believe it's particularly appropriate to raise these issues because the museum's division is in extremis. You didn't hear one word about the museums tonight. And the visibility of the 
museums in the budget materials that you were given is zero. We, before the COVID, we had a museum's manager, an administrative and assistant, a cultural arts assistant, and an artifact specialist, four dedicated, talented team members who had recruited a large number of volunteers who keep Colton Hall open year round as required in the city code. Plus it supported Doc Ricketts lab, open weekly and the city's least Presidio Museum for three or four days a week. In addition, it supported concerts, reenactments, school visitations, Christmas in the Adobe's History Fest. Okay, that was before COVID. After COVID, the museums were closed and all the museum staff were laid off, all of them. Then in September, the halftime artifact specialist, the newest staff member, was brought back with money from a special fund. He, Jordan Leininger, remains the only museum staff except for two 20-hour no-benefit docents in the Colton Hall. He has been able to preserve the three museums with almost daily visits. He has recruited volunteers to open the lab one day a month and the Presidio Museum two or three days per week. And his efforts are greatly appreciated, but he can't do it alone. He's a one half time, no benefit staffer. If he's smart, he's looking for a job. The museum and library director recommended a full time additional staffer, but somehow that position has disappeared. Thank you for your interest. Thank you. And our next speaker is Esther Malkin. Yeah, I'm sorry, Esther, before you start, I want to just let Mike know that we, the council and staff have received a letter from the Museum and Cultural Arts and also um, Mike's email has been distributed to the council and staff. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to do the multiple hat thing like um, I think it was Rick did earlier. First hat I want to wear is um, the Monterey County Renters United hat. And I want to point out that the Renter Assistance Program was majority funded by CDBG funds. There may have been a couple of other positions that were eliminated or whatever in the housing department, but the majority of it came from CDBG funds that were reallocated to that. So that did not cost the city a whole lot of money. And I don't want that to be presented as such because that program actually excluded uh, probably more people that it helped because it had to abide by the federal guidelines. Now I'm gonna switch over to just the resident hat. When I heard about the NCIP with the NIP program at the time, I thought, wow, that's really a nice program. It's something really nice for the neighborhoods to have participation in and get some projects done that the city wouldn't necessarily do. But I quickly realized that that's not what it was. The city has used NCIP like it's bank for years. We have streets that had no sidewalks and NCIP paid for them. We have drainage issues and NCIP paid for it. Those are things that cities, functioning cities, are responsible to pay for from city funds, not from a improve, neighborhood improvement program. So I feel like that program has been mis misrepresented. Um, I also want to point out that there was very little mention of how in previous meetings there were details of how the surplus money was going to be spent. And when that surplus money was announced, it was announced in the same breath with how it was going to be spent. At that time, you guys knew that the sports center needed help and surplus money wasn't set aside for it. So I have a question, you know, with that. Regarding TOT being increased, I was one of the people that pushed super hard on that, as well as for the sales tax. And I feel like we were sold a bait and switch. That is not what we bargained for when we went out hard and got this extra money for the city. The sports center, if they can't afford the slide, get rid of the slide. If you need, you know, you can get grant money from, and I've sent grant examples to the city staff that's out there for sports and health um, 
projects. So I don't know if that's been explored or not, but it should be. And lastly, I'm gonna speak as my neighborhood president. My neighborhood, all our projects have been on the table for almost a decade and not a single one is not safety related. Our safety issues need to be handled and we should not have to wait any longer than we have to wait. Thank you. Thank you. And next, Tammy Jennings, please. Thank you, Esther. Hi, um, this is Tammy Jennings, and mm -hmm. I'm I'm talking on behalf. Of, first, I would like to say thank you to Esther Malkin, Richard Rustello, uh, I, Tom Riley, uh, Jean Rush, Rick Hoyer, and Kurt Tipton. I totally agree with everything that they've said. And I was very concerned about continuing to push for projects through NCIP because again, projects were approved, funded, and then taken back. And now we've gone through the same process again. And to find out that we're gonna maybe lose $2 million of, for money for projects that were already funded once, and had to go through it again is just very um, disheartening and sad. So please don't defund NCIP, don't take our money. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. And our next speaker is um, Ensign four five, a telephone caller with 452 as the last three digits. Telephone caller 452. There we go. Go ahead, please. Hi, this is Kayla Fossum, president of Villa Del Monte Association. And I would like to second everything that Tammy Jennings, Esther Malkin, Richard Russello, and the other neighborhood presidents have expressed about the quote unquote defunding of NCIP uh, to the tune of $2 million. Um, it sounds like all of that would be for the benefit of the Monterey Sports Center. While I recognize, and I'm sure all of my fellow citizens recognize, that is a unique jewel to the city of Monterey. I think that you have broken promises. Uh, we did work really hard in every neighborhood to push for the increased TOT which we were successful in doing, even though the city council the year before really didn't want to do. So that, that was your neighborhood associations and your presidents and your citizens who pushed for that, helped you guys out. And, you know, we also pushed for the increased sales tax and, and supported you. Well, I think it's time to scratch our backs. Mm -hmm. You need to support the neighborhoods and the associations, the residents who work just as hard as you do to support. We I have always said we have a symbiotic relationship. We give and take, we support one another. But trying to take $2 million away from NCIP or the sports center is just egregious. Um, I realize all of us and all city entities, governmental entities have suffered as a result of COVID. We suffered as a result of COVID as far as NCIP went. We bit the bullet and let you take back all those funds on the promise that we would not have to go through the review process again on the projects that had already been approved and funded. And now we're having to go through the review process again, and you want $2 million from us. So. I'd just like to suggest a few things on your budget. First of all, I really agreed with um, Rick Hauser about the outrageous salaries um, in a lot of the city positions. And also, why not look into selling the Monterey Sports Center? You know, there are private people, maybe Montage, that could take over it. I realize that was just a rumor, but I think there's alternatives that you need to look at. Thank you for all your work. Bye. Thanks, Kayla. 
All right, I think it's over to the chamber at this point. Yes, let's go over to the chamber. So we, we would ask the uh, anyone who wants to speak at the council chamber, sorry we can't be with you in person. Come on up and we'd love to hear from you. I am uh, Bill Watkowski, the chair of the Museum and Cultural Arts Commission. Uh, uh, commission. Three days ago, Monterey celebrated its 252nd birthday with the great event, uh, Marienda. All the speakers and all the attendees were focused on the history and culture of Monterey. There's one division that is key uh, responsibilities to maintain and enhance that history and culture, and that's the museum division. As Mike Sovereign said, we only have a half-time person since uh, September. We have three museums, the Colton Hall, Lower Presidio, the Pacific Biological Lab. All three of those bring in visitors. Heritage tourism is a big factor for people visiting uh, Monterey. If you want detailed numbers on that, we've been keeping track of the visitations, even though we've only been open on weekends, but uh, you can get those numbers from Inga. So we strongly, it's a unanimous recommendation. I'm not gonna go over all the issues that Mike presented. It's all in our April 7th letter, but we really, really need a full-time staff person in addition to our half-time specialists. It's even more uh, aggravated by the loss of Inga in July. Our last two library directors have also supervised the museum and both of them, Inga and Kim Bowie Burton, were very good, they were knowledgeable about the museum. When we get a new library director, that person is gonna be hit with a lot of library issues and museum is gonna be at the bottom. We need a full-time staff person in addition to our current uh, half-time person. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Hi, Dwayne Peterson, Villa Del Monte. Uh, where's my stipend? Oh, that's right. I'm a volunteer. Uh, I'm kind of... <laughs> uh, do, do you need us anymore? I mean, if we can just kind of deal... Uh, kind of backdoor. I know it's legal. I know it's allowed. But I'm just very disappointed. Thank you, Dwayne. Good evening, Mayor and uh, City Council and, and City staff. Um, I I'm the treasurer for uh, Skyline Forest HOA. I've been on NIP or NCIP for 20 years. Hmm. Uh, also, this uh, September, I'll have been and in, in, in uh, NERT or CERT for the last 25 years. So I've been a volunteer for a long time. That stipend does sound good. Um, <laughs> I think it's somewhat disingenuous that we restarted the NCIP program. We ended up with 205 projects to look at with somewhere between 15 and $17 million worth of requests. And if we end up with $2 million to look at, to consider parsing across all of those projects, we're gonna be giving out baby fingers to projects and not able to fund a damn thing that makes any difference. We have safety projects that probably aggregate up to the $4 million or four, almost $5 million that were can be considered. But part of what city council took away when they pulled back the projects was the original $819,000 that I, the Finance Committee of NCIP, working with the then city engineers, set aside to be able to build those projects. Because that inflation that we're all dealing with is also going up in those projects. We left about, as I recall, 5.3 million of projects that are approved. I still am working with our current NCIP engineer to say, what is the contingency need on those projects? because gas has gone up, which means asphalt's gone up, which everything else has gone up. What's it actually gonna to take to build 5.3 million in projects? Because it may be that we have to fund 
$2 million of the money that we do have for contingency just to build the projects that have been approved mm -hmm. from as much as 15 years ago. Is that my three minutes? You, you, have, you have one more minute. Oh. Um, so, you know, I asked the, the beginning question, was it disingenuous to restart the NCIP? I, a lot of us have spent a lot of time, 20 years doing that. Um, I'd like to see the thing succeed. It's democracy from the ground up. It's one of the few programs like this in the nation. And it's a chance for us to build better neighborhoods. So I'd appreciate your support. I do have one thought looking over the budget numbers that uh, Hans presented. Um, we get a lot of this funding from TOT. Uh, those same people park in those parking lots. The parking lot revenue was $11 million. Um, I'm a finance guy. Okay, let's do a 20% price increase on parking. Let's get the $2 million from there. Thank you, Thank you Dennis. Uh, hello, uh, Lance Kohler, uh, co-chair for the Canary Row Business Association and business owner. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Council, staff, and Hans. I first want to thank Hans for his outreach and willingness to review the proposed budget with our district and other business districts. Uh, we appreciate the communication. We understand that you have very difficult decisions to make with this year's budget. So tonight, I just want to share our desire that the City of Monterey continue to invest in their business districts. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it is to my understanding that during the 4 p.m. session uh, that it came up that the CRBA, CRBA had a small reserve. I just want to clarify that we do have a small reserve, but that's to cover expenses that we've already um, committed to. With that being said, we've always been good stewards of the money received from the city. Furthermore, we're appreciative for the, uh, for the partnership we have with the city of Monterey and hope that the positive experiences continue. Specifically, the CRBA has made big strides in improving our district. I've now been doing business on Canary Row for 17 years. And in that time, we have been able to improve our district into a significantly cleaner, safer, and more welcoming and enjoyable environment for tourists and local residents. <clears throat> our district allocates zero funds to marketing. So 100% of our budget goes towards cleanliness efforts and preserving the historic value of our district. We have taken on additional and voluntary porter services to ensure that our district remains clean and welcoming. We have focused our budget on supporting and enhancing the historical value of Canary Row and clearly identifying our district through various projects, which include, but are not limited to, unique street signs with 3D uh, sardine tops, decorative wave pattern crosswalks that also help with visibility and safety, um, decorative parking meter sleeves, multiple murals along Canary Row and the Rec Trail, Steinbeck and American Flag banner programs, aesthetically pleasing trash receptacles and news racks, and many more projects that enhance the guest experience in our district. We have decided that there are budgetary restraints this year, and we encourage council and staff to continue to invest in our business districts that in turn generate a return for the city on that investment. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. Hello, everybody. My name is Christina Riddock. Um, I am the current president of the Lighthouse District. I'm also on the board of the Cannery Road District as I have businesses in both locations. Uh, I was asked on behalf of many of the owners on Lighthouse to represent them because the majority of the business owners um, are uh, owner operated and many and uh, could not be here. But everyone we followed up with truly appreciates the services the additional city funds have provided in the past. Uh, the website, trick-or-treating on Lighthouse, movies in the park, and the extra advertising with posters and banners and et cetera. And the funds also provide motivation to decorate windows for the holidays because there is a slight cash prize for that. Um, Lighthouse also has the lowest percentage of, um, it's only a 25% um, uh, of the business license. And so, and it's also at a 250 cap. So we actually really rely on the the funding that the city provides. Um, and we're always very grateful for the additional funds. Uh, Lighthouse District also has the most diverse shops in the area. We don't have large um, uh, motels or hotels. Um, not only are the majority of the business locally owned and operated, a large number of those owners are immigrants and mostly are women. 
We also have a pretty high percentage of owners who are people of color. Many of the smaller owned businesses on Lighthouse barely made it through the pandemic lockdowns and some are still struggling to pay off debt incurred during that time. So again, any additional funds for all of our districts are appreciated. And I just wanna briefly go over a lot of the small businesses that actually are on Lighthouse. Um, we have, and all, these are all owner operated businesses. American Burger, Bon Toy, Bonton Leroy Smokehouse, Carpets and Floors, Catalyst Consignment, Chic Advent Rentals, Classy Nails, Crystal Fish, Current Comics, uh, Cypress Boutique, Danny Mini Mart, Dapper's Union, Design Time, Escape Room A31, Fashion Trade, Headdress, I Heart You Candles, International Market, La Bahia, Lighthouse Books, Lilify, Malinka uh, European Market, Mary Jane's, Mission 19, Namaste, NorCal Smoke Shop, On the Beach, Orchid Nails, Pamir Rugs, Paprika Cafe, Pearl Hour, Playful Ground, Plato's Closet, Pocket Change, Rain Technology, Sahara Sun, Sakura, Takaria Del Mar, The Break Room, The Perfect Crumb, Top Nails, Wanju, Wan and Zob Zob. I thank everybody for their time. Thank you, Christina. To the mayor, council members, uh, the memorable city manager uh, and city staff, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the business improvement district funding. My name is Barry Reddock. My wife and I own and operate four businesses in Monterey. Three are served by the Canary Row BID. One is served by the new Monterey BID. Um, if we're gonna continue with stipend jokes, I suggest we increase it so Tyler and Dan can both turn on lights. Um, <laughs> These funds for the BID are critical <laughs> to the success. I thought slight the mood a little. It seems a little hectic in here. These funds are critical to the success and operation of our businesses. The BID funds provide for additional exposure, marketing reach, and community involvement that we cannot fund on our own. It increases our ability to participate in the community with the city's help. And then we do that in a meaningful way. These dollars add critical resources that enhance our service offerings to customers and create an inviting environment for customers to come and visit. More importantly, it creates an environment where customers will, would like to return to. We understand that the city has faced extraordinary challenges during the pandemic. As small business owners, we feel that same pain. We understand what it is like to come out of this event, look around and wonder how we are going to fund different parts of our operations. We felt the burden of forced closures and an inability to generate revenue during that time. We did know one thing though, that we had to keep our visibility high in our name in front of the people. We kept advertising so that we stayed top of mind. The BID website supporting our Lighthouse Avenue location was a valuable outreach tool for us and allowed us to transition in-person operations to selling other products online. Without the city's support, we couldn't have done that. We are seeking a collaborative solution. Taking such a binary approach, turning off the funding completely, doesn't seem to be the solution that helps all parties. It doesn't allow for the win-win. Continuing to work together and supporting each other seems to be the viable approach as we move forward. It has always been our vision that this is a partnership. As we perform better, that allows the city to do more it is this type of symbiotic relationship that we look to strengthen. We appreciate the contribution of our hospitality partners on the hotel side. Their set contribution is a valuable asset that benefits from the tourists that visit our town. Our customer base extends to locals as well. And the opportunities for locals to visit, creating a place they want to visit is a direct result of the funding that the city provides via the BID. It gives us a cleaner cannery row, creates a safe Halloween event on Lighthouse, and it creates movies in the park for our entire community. I appreciate your time and thank you very much. Thank you, Barry. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Um, my name is Rick Johnson. I'm executive director of the old Monterey Business Association and administrator of the new Monterey Business Association for the next five weeks. Uh -huh. I've already sent a letter in that's in your packet, and I won't mm -hmm. repeat that right now, 
But I want to underline that it has been our goal for the last 22 years to serve our businesses and our residents as everyone's downtown for Monterey and for the entire peninsula. The contribution from the city has helped us do just that. We stepped up 12 years ago to organize and present the 4th of July parade and 11 years ago to take over the traditional uh, Christmas tree lighting to kick off the holidays for the city when the city couldn't afford to do them. We continue to do them and plan on continuing to do them because we recognize that we are partners in the success of Monterey. For residents, it may be something um, they don't think about, but I firmly believe that we have a very important role on residential home values because often cities are rated for the quality of life by how inviting their downtowns are. We seek out businesses for the downtown that reflect what the residents, homeowners, and renters want in order to celebrate their downtown. We have fully embraced the city's efforts to have mixed use housing in the downtown, and it's worked. The partnership between the business community in Old Monterey and in New Monterey, city government, and our residents is one that everybody in the city can be extremely proud of, and we are. Your investment in the downtown and in all the business districts returns your money over and over and over again in TOT dollars because visitors want to come back to Monterey and explore more of the town. Sales tax revenue is growing from all sectors and all districts in Monterey at a time when the city needs the income that we generate together in all of Monterey's business districts. And in new Monterey, we often serve as an incubator area where people can try out their dreams. Some succeed and stay on Lighthouse and some others move into different districts within the city because we gave them the space to perfect their business plan and gain experience to succeed. Your, uh, please continue to invest that less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of the budget to keep all the business districts rolling forward for the good of everyone in Monterey and the good of your budget. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Mr. Mayor, uh, City Council, I'm John Castagna. I'm a member of the Museums and Cultural Arts Commission. Uh, I'll be very brief because I don't want to repeat uh, the excellent presentation that uh, uh, Bill Wojcicki uh, made about the activities and importance of the uh, commission. And just wanted to underline the extreme shortage of uh, help that the uh, half-time um, worker that uh, is uh, doing such an excellent job and point out the importance of the cultural dimension that uh, the commission is in charge of and its importance to both the uh, uh, citizens of Monterey and also uh, tourists. I think that's something that uh, we need to keep in mind and uh, we really need, do need more help and that I think reflects the opinions of all the other members of the commission. Thank you. Thank you, John. Mr. Mayor, that concludes public comment here in the council chambers. All right, then at that point, I'll close the public hearing portion of the meeting and switch the view back to gallery. All right, so uh, we appreciate everybody's input. Hans, uh, we probably need the slide with respect to the recommendations that you wanted guidance on this evening and which most of the people spoke to. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, we'll, we'll put up the slide right now. Okay. Yeah, well, while all this was going on, I was thinking uh, I could probably spend the next hour talking about budgets, and et cetera, et cetera. And I bet all the council members could too. <laughs> yeah. 
but meanwhile, what I'd like to do is council's approval. Let's uh, focus in on some of the recommendations because those are more short term with respect to this upcoming budget. But I think the big elephant in the room is while you're getting that ready, I'm just going to ramble. The big ele uh, elephant in the room is we have a structural deficit. Okay, what does that mean? That means the structure needs fixing. And so going forward, we really have to take a look at what the new normal is going to be. And I have some thoughts about that as well. But anyway, I don't want to belabor that. I, I just, um, normally I would wait to the end, but I think uh, I want to jump in on recommendation number one, uh, having uh, probably been to more NCIP meetings, maybe not more than Rick and Richard than anybody else. And that is, uh, I'm not interested in taking money from uh, the NCIP. We did that last year. I think it's fair for the staff to come in uh, or the Parks and Recreation Commission with respect to the, uh, to the sports center. I think it's fair to come in with specific projects rather than one large sum. And as was pointed out by Rick, the uh, NCIP has been very good about helping with the Monterey Sports Center as well as other community-wide, citywide projects. So I, I just want to put that on the table right away. It takes a four-fifth vote. If there's someone else who's not interested in doing that, then that issue's off the list. So that would be my suggestion. It doesn't need a motion, but that's where I'm coming from. So if we can focus on that, I, I'm not. I won't. Uh, I'm not in favor of uh, taking money away from the NCIP, but I am more in favor of asking that our commissions and our staff apply for projects. I think that's the way to go. And I could talk about NCIP for an hour as well. So I'll open the floor. Mayor. Council Member Tyler, then we'll go to Council Member Dan, Council Member Allen, okay. Could I offer an alternative that I think was a, um, suggested by staff, which is um, putting these forward in front of the NCIP and seeing how they take on that discussion um, and then bringing it back to the council depending upon how that goes. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little uh, uh, feedback. So your, your, your suggestion was, again, I'm sorry, Tyler, I honestly didn't hear it. So I, I believe one of the council's um, al alternative suggestions there Both NCI, am I, I see Ed shaking his head. No, am I, am I misunderstanding what that alternative was? That no, you, you're fro you froze account? again. Your screen froze again. Okay. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we're good. Okay. There, there's some feedback, Tyler. That's the problem. I, I, I'm not getting all your words. Yeah, just half of it. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Then share the important half, will you? <laughs> <laughs> there was an alternative proposed earlier by staff. Okay, right. Um, in regards to having it go to NCIP. What do you Hans mean with, the, with that to ask just would? to go in front of the CIP and ask for them to uh, recommend contributing $2 million to the city? Is that what you're saying? That's correct. Yeah, I think it was on a slide here earlier. Okay, all right. That's one alternative. You've heard where I am. So, Council Member Dan. Thank you. I guess we'll just stay with that recommendation and I'll go ahead and talk to that. Um, uh, I think one comment was made by um, one of the, the public that said that this is that the sports center is the jewel of, of the city of Monterey. And, and I have to agree because I'm there a lot. It's, mm -hmm. it's a wonderful, wonderful facility. Uh, but it is in its 30, 30 year lifespan yeah. and it does need um, capital improvements. There's no question about that. Um, and, and using $2 million out of the NCIP is, is something that, that, that it could use. There's no question about that. However, though, um, when the NCIP was put in place, um, and I know that, uh, Mayor Clyde was there when that happened. Um, we, we made a, a um, or, or they decided that uh, the neighborhoods were the most important piece um, 
to that funding and, and to allow the neighbors to make decisions on what projects um, they were going to put forward so that we can improve the neighborhoods. And, and I think somebody said that it's a grassroots effort. And, and I totally agree with that. And, and I do agree that, that if, if the NI, NCIP decides that a, a project of, of a larger magnitude that will, that will, um, will help the whole city, then, then they, there should be some money based on that. And they've done it. There, there, as a matter of fact, the Monterey High football field was uh, given some NCIP uh, money many years ago, which we were very grateful uh, that they did that. Um, however, though, um, I, I think it would be um, in the best interest of uh, the, the uh, wow. it would be the best interest of, of the, the heart of NCIP to keep it that way that it, it stays within the neighborhoods and the projects that they choose. So I, I think we need to find another way to fund uh, the, uh, the sports centers um, issues. Uh, maybe uh, we should have been thinking about that many, many years ago instead of allowing for deferred maintenance. Mm -hmm. That's almost like school districts do that a lot uh, because they're focused on what's going on in the classroom and they're not so much focused on what's going on in the school sites. And unfortunately, it becomes deferred maintenance. And before you know it, oh, we got to do something about it. And then they start robbing other funds, just like it's being suggested now. So for me, um, uh, Clyde, um, Mayor Clyde, uh, if you're looking for that other vote, um, you got it. Because I, I think that, that the N NCIP should stay focused on the neighborhoods and those projects. Okay, thank you, Dan. And uh, just adding on to what you had mentioned, uh, several members of the public offered some alternatives and ways to, to finance uh, the needs of the sports centers. Um, for example, when uh, the city gave uh, uh, relief to our businesses, we took a half a million dollars out of the parking fund. And one, one member of the public mentioned uh, the parking fund. Others uh, mentioned uh, delaying the PERS one year. Another one was delaying the uh, increasing, well, you heard it, increasing the fund for economic uncertainty. It's, uh, and I can tell you about the history of that too, but I, I could tell you about a history of a lot of this stuff. But the public had some alternatives that we could ask staff to look at. And it could be one-time money or it could be payback money. So others on uh, Ed and uh, and Council Member Ed, Council Member Allen, Council Member Allen, go ahead on, on the uh, NCIP, please. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that, but I, I'd like to put a bit of a context to my statements. So mm -hmm. as I'm listening tonight, it seems to me that all of our stakeholders in the city are ready for the pandemic to be over and mm -hmm. I'm ready for the pandemic to be over. Unfortunately, the pandemic is not finished with the city of Monterey. Mm -hmm. And so not surprisingly, we've had the business interests. They wanna make sure that business districts continue to be funded. We have NCIP reps who wanna make sure that every dollar of NCIP is allocated by NCIP and doesn't go to other city needs. We have folks from um, the museum board who want to make sure the museum is funded, um, not if, even as it was in the past, but funded um, better than is being um, budgeted in this proposal. Mm -hmm. And we have folks who didn't speak tonight, but council's well aware that employees of the city expect to be paid. Uh, and the reality is we heard from residents who think they're paid too much. I'm telling you, we are losing employees right and left. Why? Because for many, many years, the city could pay salaries that um, allowed us to keep um, our great staff here. Well, now other cities have more money and we don't have as much money. And so we don't have as much money for all of the various city services. We don't have as much money for the staff who make those city services wonderful. 
and uh, and here we are, and it's not much fun. Yeah. And I don't hear anybody really wanting to give anything. anymore. Everybody wants to go back and kind of pretend the pandemic isn't still affecting us, but in the city of Monterey, it's still affecting us. So I guess in a way, I'm a little disappointed. I'm a little disappointed that no one is able to really see the big picture and see the various serious financial challenges that our city is in. And I'm not sure it's gonna get better anytime soon. That's my concern. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that it's gonna get better because we are still very depending on tourism. The pandemic hasn't gone away and um, we're not seeing conferences coming back. We're not seeing people going to the sports center and use those services in the same way to make it um, cost support in you know, supporting its own expenses. So anyway, that's, I guess I'm a little disappointed too. All right, with respect to the um, sports center request, I would just note that it, it troubles me a little bit that people want to say, oh, there's, N there's NCIP money and there's city money or there's NCIP. You know what? It's all, it is all the public city of the city and, and the public's money. And, you know, I think over time, there's kind of got to be this kind of disjunction. And I, I don't think that's actually very healthy. And the reality is at, at the end of the day, the council decides what to fund and what not to fund. And 99.9% .9 of the time, we thank our NCIP reps and we fund exactly what they, they recommend, but we don't always do that. So I don't know. Uh, from my point of view, if you wanna have a sports center, and I believe that there are council members who think that that is a core, service of the city, then you have to maintain it. And, um, and I think it's totally appropriate that some of that maintenance comes from the NCIP. And I recognize that council and NCIP over the years have sometimes done that. Well, right now we've got a very serious situation and I, and kind of what I'm hearing is, well, we don't like the way the city presented it or, you know, so I think at a minimum, we should ask that they fund the dehumidifier. That's what I think. It sounds like there aren't votes for that, but um, that's what I think. I think that if you wanna have a sports center, you've gotta maintain it. And I don't think you're gonna do that very well if you let um, rust uh, you know, compromise the structure of the building. And I don't think a $60,000 fix that may or may not work is a good investment. So that's where I stand on that. And I guess I'll talk about the other issues later. All right, thanks, Alan. I think you put it in a really good perspective. Things that I've been thinking about as well, where we all have to give. Uh, Council Member Ed? Yeah. Um, I tried to move so I'd have better light because I didn't want to uh, be the subject <laughs> of Gary's joke. Yeah. Um, so I want to say thank you all to those that uh, called in or came to the council chambers tonight thank you very much for your time and efforts and all of you were well spoken um i think barry back to barry uh kudos for you using the word uh you know a binary choice and i want to say that the staffs presented the council options and sometimes it appears to be uh, binary but Actually, it's it's not that at all. Um, it, it's going to take several different layers. All five of, of those that serve on the council are going to have their perspectives of, of how to make the, the recommendations here, there, so that we advance the ball. Um, so some callers tonight wanted to take some shots at the process or to the staff or the disappointment. The staff is doing exactly what the council has tasked them with, which is be raw, be blunt, be transparent, bring to us uh, what their thinking is. And we may not agree. Uh, we may have some other suggestions. We may send them back and ask for them to dig down deeper a little bit harder and then come back on the 21st when we, we finally get to the point where we're ready to take a vote on a very comprehensive budget. So 
Um, you don't, don't, please don't be taking any shots to uh, the city manager and the council because they did exactly what we expect them to do. The rest of this public policy is up to the council for us to try and interpret the will of the people. What this is essentially is, is trying to determine, does the community trust us? Does this process in some way serve and identify what's in the public interest? And that is probably the two hardest concepts uh, to serve as an elected or as a staff member. So this is where we are uh, on this particular option. Um, you know, I, I just don't, I don't think it's, uh, it's what I heard tonight. I don't think it's what I heard this week ever since the agenda item was published that is in the will of the, the folks that reached out and contacted me. And when I'm saying not in their will and not what they prefer, I think they don't prefer and they do not want uh, to lose the $2 million from the process of the NCIP. But we still have, on the other hand, the need to fund the emergencies that have been identified by staff, which they have been told, bring us a transparent document, and the rest is up to us to figure out where the money comes from. So we have two weeks. I think we put out the question asking for the NCIP reps to find out, is there some level of this identified emergency? see on what needs to be done at the sports center. Is there any opportunity where some of these can be taken off and partnered with? And we're making the ask of those that participate in NCIP. And if we didn't ask before, we're asking tonight. We have loved your partnership. We have always seen this as collaborative. And we don't need to talk about the history over the last 10 or 15 years of what money's been taken or did we have lists that got long and you didn't get your project done? Ed, you're, you're frozen. I'm council member Ed, you're, you're froze there. And we'll wait for you to, for that to. And it seems like there's there never enough money and there's always lots of things to do. Ed, I hope you can hear me. You're, you're, you're going in and out. There you are. Okay, sorry about that, bad signal. But we have, to, we have to really hone our skills and say, well, what's in the public interest? And I think what's not in the public interest is to take the $2 million. However, I think that the way I wanna close the gap is what part of the NCIP effort can be identifying some things that are projects that could possibly be uh, handled and also is there a way to stretch this out? Because not all the $2 million probably needs to be done right now. Do we keep the, uh, the slides closed for a little bit longer? Do we pursue the best repair? Maybe it's not 60,000, but maybe the repair gets us four or five years. I don't know, I'm not an engineer, but I know they're, all of them are priorities, but just like anything else in a household where you've got to do the roof and you've got a foundation and maybe you need a kitchen, hardly ever do you do it all at the same time. So I think we have to parse out some of the projects and some of those projects may take a year. And I think I would ask the staff to prioritize using the $750,000 in reserves that sits ready to be used in the sports center see where else we might be able to have some revenue that comes at mid-year and we might have to execute some of these projects in January and February and March. Um, so there's a couple other things on our agenda item. I want to stop talking because you want to go back to those other alternatives. So that's where I sit on the NCIP. I think it's, uh, it's not something I feel comfortable doing, but I realize that we still have to find the money to get the repairs done relatively soon and that means probably the next budget year all right thank you council member dan could i just make a suggestion to the staff or even the council mm -hmm. uh, right now our um our conference center is at the beginning of its of its facilities life we just redid it and and so it probably will not need um remodeling or uh, uh, rehab or anything for at least five or six years. 
And I'm a big proponent of, of starting a reserve for the conference center because I would hate to see this happen 30 years from now coming back. But like I said, it's at the beginning of its fis fiscal or facilities life. Our sports center is at the end of its getting close to the end of its facilities life. So maybe the 250 that we are putting in the reserve for the sports center and the 250 that we're putting in for the, uh, the Maori Conference Center, maybe taking a portion of that conference center reserve and putting it into the sports center because that's where the need really is, might be part of a solution. Uh, only be, I, I wouldn't say that if the, the it's 10 years down the road from the last rehab of the conference center, but we are mm -hmm. at the beginning. Yeah, that, that's a great suggestion. Uh, Dan, can I follow up on some of the out of the box thinking back to the repairs at the sports center? I remember driving past the football stadium, the Dan Albert football stadium for a number of years with a count of donations I know that we've seen um, public donations participate in building uh, ball fields and parking for schools. Why not ask the public to help us with the sports center and have a fundraising where we ask people to replace the slide? I think the slide budget was 300. 350,000, you're going in and out on us again, Ed, sorry. You're frozen at this point. I see you, Tyler. We'll catch council member no, Tyler next. <laughs> and oh, by the way, we $32 million deficit. So is it appropriate to ask the public to help to replace something that needs to be replaced as they're coming in? I don't know what the visitor count is now at the sports center, but why not start a fundraising for that one item? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Council Member Tyler? Yeah, so uh, I feel like my thought process around this whole topic is aligning with um, what Council Member uh, uh, Hoffa has been sharing. Um, it, and, and, and the idea of using reserve funds, I, I actually applaud staff for making this effort towards establishing funds. And I've heard a lot of comments tonight from um, you know, I, I guess some of this indication from council, but also I think more so from, from the public around this idea that we failed, we kicked the can down the road. Then it sounds like, but we want you to kick the can down the road more. <laughs> and to me, that's just, it, it, it's, it doesn't make business sense. It doesn't make sense when I think about the younger generations and trying to not put a deeper burden on them on us i don't think it's fair and so to say that we're going to go backwards and take funding out of a reserve i, I don't understand what that's what that really is solving other than trying to satisfy a group of folks that feel like they want to have a little bit of control over a pot of funding and i understand the sensitivity around this i really do because we as a city have made a promise to a group of people to a body a committee that we've established the voters approved this and then we made this promise that at the beginning of the pandemic we were going to restore the funding we made all these promises and i think that's where the frustration lies it doesn't lie in the fact that we're trying to find a way of riding a ship. And I think that's just kind of where the where I'm having a little trouble. At this point, it seems clear that we're not gonna be moving forward with the, with the staff proposal. Um, but I think that as a council, we have to do the hard work. And the hard work isn't saying, let's take money, money out of reserves. That's, that is truly kicking the can down the road and putting the burden on future future generations, whether it's reserves, whether it's for um, any any of the reserve fund, uh, fund accounts that we've established, it really doesn't help us. Um, so I think it's either we fund the projects and we do the infrastructure that's needed, 
or we eliminate some programs. And I think that's where the hard decision really lies. Let's not try to walk around it and try to keep everything um, and then not really solve the problem. Uh, I don't think we're doing anybody any, any good. So is there a proposal for potentially eliminating programs in, in, in our budget? Um, otherwise, I, 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 I just, I wonder what do we do? I'm, I'm not a fan of, of um, eliminating the proposals for, um, for, for any of the reserves because I think that that isn't, isn't appropriate, it's prudent. And I, in my notes, before we even started the council meeting, that was one of the things that I want to applaud staff the most because it is getting us on the right track. And I know that we're in, in this fiscal climate right now, but there was um, an article earlier that came out from the Washington Post that said the World Bank warns global economy may suffer 1970s style of stagflation. So mm. we're, we're in this tough economic situation now. It doesn't look like it's going to get any better in the near term. So why would we do something assuming that tomorrow we're going to be okay when it doesn't look like that? Yeah, I hear that. I, I, this is why I think we all have, uh, I'm sorry, Dan, we all have some ideas of, of how to fund the sports center. Uh, we put them on the table. It's, it looks like NCIP does not going to be the source of that. Oh, they may be, if asked. And so that's incumbent upon NCIP and also uh, Parks and Rec and staff to put together some really good pro projects so they can be voted on. But we didn't hesitate to take uh, money out of the parking fund for uh, business loans, which we forgave. And also, finally, we did pass a 5% maintenance and renewal fee. So you could always pay back the funds, the parking funds, for example. I'm not saying that solution, but the point is, I would suggest that there are other funds that the staff can recommend to us. They're bright, they're brilliant. They can come up with some uh, ideas. Mayor, could, could we loop back around to Ed's comment? Because I wasn't sure it was clear to me that we were going down the path of, of accepting the alternative for recommendation one. Well, Tyler, I'd like to respond to your comment. Yeah, so it's Dan's turn. Thank you, Tyler. If you'd like, if I could. Now, please, Council so, Member Dan. I, I, I'm not proposing that we take, and I'm, I, I was the biggest proponent of reserves for the, the uh, Monterey um, Conference Center. I was extremely happy that they were taking reserves and putting it in a fund that we could, we could uh, use down the road. Uh, I have, please trust me, I, I'm for reserves. However, to balance the budget, we took the carryover from this year to balance a budget and that could have gone into reserves. So we're already using reserves to even balance a budget. So to me, um, you know, are, I, are we though? I, I thought yes, that the we two are. Point, yes, I we are. Two, two point five million is going coming out of this year's carryover to balance the budget. Is that true, Raphael? Huh? Yeah, that's what I thought. And yeah. that's no way to budget, folks. That that that's a dangerous way of trying to. Um, tr it's a dangerous practice because it's not sustainable because now you're relying on the next year's carryover and the next year's carryover, which may not be there. Could I, could I get clarity on that? Because when I asked that question earlier, I guess maybe I, I didn't comprehend what that two point, of, what, what did we, what did, what, what um, rainy day fund, fund did we put that 2.5 in that we're taking that from now to support next year's budget? Yeah, I can answer that if if yes, Mr. please. Let's city manager go for it. So we're expecting uh, at the end of this fiscal year, uh, which ends on June thirtieth, uh, to have an unassigned balance, an ending balance. Uh, actually, when we did our reserve um, allocations at mid-year, we looked at having possibly an ending balance. Uh, which uh, which we have to identify exactly when the books are closed and audited, which will be in November. But we are pretty certain that there are 2.4 million and a little bit more uh, right now that we have allocated off an expected unassigned balance 
to uh, fund next year's operating expenses. So I call this uh, the, the slingshot effect, where we basically use the, the ending balance to go into next fiscal year and um, fund operate, uh, operations or maybe even uh, one-time expenses. This year, they have to go fully into the operations. And uh, Councilmember Albert pointed it out, that's not a good sustainable way of, of budgeting. So um, in the past, uh, uh, during the time of, of me working uh, under the council supervision as city manager, we have never done that before. We never used unassigned balance and uh, fixed budget holds in next fiscal year. The other part that, that uh, uh, got kind of lost in translation here is, that NCIP is funded in the current fiscal year as well. We somewhere lost a yes. year here in the in the discussion uh, of, of a couple of minutes ago. This year, fiscal year FY 21-22, there are $3.385 million going to the NCIP for, um, for projects. So this year, $3.385 million, that, that's money that the council put into the bank for the uh, purpose of neighborhood uh, community improvement program and next fiscal year the number is 4.96 so i um, i wanted just to to uh, remind uh, the council of that also gene who uh, said it's six years with nothing and uh, no not really um we we put money aside fiscal year 21 22 3.385 million okay so uh, what i'm going to do sorry Tony. We, we only have 25 minutes and we're not voting tonight, as I well know, and this is a presentation. So we're just kind of giving direction. We have the right to change our minds when it comes down to the actual vote. But I think the next thing we should do is get to the next recommendation. There were three total. Let's go to the second one. At least we can get those wrapped up tonight and continue our discussion when we actually make the vote. So Hans, I think the next step would be to look at the second recommendation. Yeah, uh, and that's about um, uh, suspension of the funds for the business district. Right. And again, we're not voting. Uh, we're just sharing thoughts on this. And just what I, I we're thinking, say, Council Member Allen? Yeah, I mean, I, I support this. Um, again, like the other like the other programs and services before us, you know, these are valuable services, although I will say one thing that's different is I feel like businesses that are in, you know, in the business of making money, make their own decisions about where they invest and whether that investment is a good return on the investment. And if they believe that this is a good return on the investment, they can choose to fund it. Um, so. I, I just I, I'm I've never actually been really comfortable with the public subsidizing um, businesses. I just don't think that's the proper role of government philosophically. Um, and I I do believe that if those business associations think that this is valuable and worthwhile to their businesses, they will make up that difference. It's not a lot of money in the big scheme of things, especially compared to some of the other issues that are before us. But um, I, I think that it is significant and symbolic in showing that we're not simply, again, asking residents alone to bear the cost of trying to um, develop a fiscally responsible budget, but we're also looking to our business partners. So I do support the proposal. Okay, thank you, Alan. And, and again, sorry to repeat myself. I just want to make sure we understand we're not voting, but just giving general direction and what our, where our thinking is. All right, other thoughts, Council Member Ed. Yeah, um, I'd like to see if um, staff could come back to, to let us know the effect. I know this is the recommendation, uh, but several of these associations uh, like New Monterey, Business Association District, Kenner Row, North Fremont. Uh, $10,000, well, 10.5 is not a lot, but under these circumstances, it means a lot to us because we're trying to close a gap. Um, I propose that maybe this should be a 50% this year and then take a new look next year. 
uh, to at least allow them to have a bit of a parachute. So rather than it being uh, cut completely, I would. Ed, Ed, again, we, we've lost you. You're frozen again. You you couldn't you couldn't hear. Can you hear me? You, you the last thing we heard was a fifty percent golden parachute. There there you go. I wouldn't call it a golden parachute. I know. I threw that in there just to yeah. see if you were listening. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe a paper parachute. But yeah, I I think and reassess this next year in the next year budget cycle. But I I would say what. Could we come back uh, from staff? I'd like to hear uh, a counter to this, so maybe 50%. All right, other thoughts? Uh, Council Member Dan? Um, yes, and um, I just wanted to respond to Alan's um, comment about uh, subsidizing businesses. I can understand that, Alan. I, I can see how people would think uh, that the city of Monterey doesn't actually have a retail store or own a hotel. There's no question about that, so why would we subsidize uh, other businesses. However, though, the way I look at this is that 48% of our revenue comes from businesses. And so we are partners with those businesses, whether we like it or not, we are in the hospitality business. And so as partners, I think it, it helps us, helps them, helps us promote the city, which in turn promotes the sales tax, which in turn promotes the TOT which is 48% of our budget. So that's, that, that's the way that I justify giving or subsidizing businesses. That's it, thanks, Mayor. Yeah, thank you. Any more comments on this? Again, we'll be voting on this at our next meeting or a special meeting. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate um, Ed's now, Tyler, like a potential you've... proposal. Am I You're frozen now? A little bit. Can you hear me? I'm yeah. Trying. In and out. I don't know You're what's going on. In the dark. Um, I, I was just saying I appreciate Ed's proposal. It was a different way than than I was thinking. Um, an alternative thought is if we end up with a surplus um, that we weren't expecting, at as an example, like this current fiscal year. Um, that that could be a potential proposal, although mm -hmm. it's towards the end of the fiscal year. I just wonder if that could be um, an alternative solution. But I, I do like Ed's idea, and and if that's the direction that the city ends up going, at least it's a, a way of um, weaning the business districts off of that um, as a funding source. If that's the direction that the city ultimately takes. Okay. Thank you. Good creative thinking. All right, and let's see. Uh, can we look? Last Rick, were there? Ed, your hand still up? Did you want to say something? Uh, no, go ahead. Okay, let's take a look at the third. Uh, recommend. I believe there were three when we started this almost four hours ago. Three hours past my bedtime. <laughs> okay, staffing levels. Do you want me to begin? <laughs> yeah, sure, whoever wants to, okay. that's fine. Uh -huh. Sure, sure. Um, I, I'm, just, I'm just happy that we're starting to move back into putting positions back as revenue comes back, putting positions back um, uh, in, in our staffing uh, FTE, which, is, which I, I, I like. Just I wanna make sure that we don't start new programs which create new staffing positions before the revenue is actually um, mm. seen in the next couple of years. So I, like I said, I, when I read the staff report and I saw how many positions were being put back or exchanged or however they wanted to put it, and it looks like there's only two new positions. And to me, those positions look uh, important, especially when it comes to business license, um, Overse overseeing business license, I think that's a, a good deal. And, and also safety uh, training with a, a, with a fire station, I think that's a, a good deal too. So uh, just last comments, I, I think that's uh, what the recommendations are, are, are good, I, I like them. 
Okay. Councilmember Tyler. I have a question in regards to the, the business license collection position. The In the budget proposal, are we assuming an increase in business license fees due to that position being established? Uh, yes, uh, I, I hope, Rafaela, are you, are you still yeah, with she's us? She's there and she just unmuted. Yeah. Uh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so what we are anticipating is that for that position to be one that's actually out canvassing. So we've been, um, we're assuming that there's a lot of businesses out there that have not paid their business licenses. So that's the position actually to actually be out door to door canvassing um, and hoping that will actually um, stimulate revenue to coming in that building. Raphael, I think uh, was about three or four years ago that position found a lot of underpaid uh, business licenses and non-business license and actually paid for itself and That's more mm -hmm. yeah and so that one actually brought revenue into the city just just by monitoring it yeah yeah so, so if, I, I think just to kind of conclude my my thoughts here i i generally agree with what um dan has been saying um i, I i'm excited to see towards a direction of, of bringing um, back these positions. Uh, it, it would be helpful to, to see the budget in, in the aggregate, but um, I'm, I'm generally in support of it. I think it's a good direction. Yep, okay. Council Member Allen? Well, I mean, who can be against bringing back positions, right? <laughs> right. Bringing back services. So yeah, I'm all for it. And this probably of all the various things would be my number one priority. But I just am wondering how we're going to pay for it because I just don't see how we're going to pay for it. That's my concern. And uh, you know, we've we we know that our employee groups are looking for pay raises that are going to keep up with inflation, and they have a right to expect that. And um, and and again, to the public who may not know this, we're losing really good people, and um, and it's because the 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 employment situation has changed a lot of people chose to retire a lot of baby boomers are retiring a lot of people are just choosing to to kind of live and work differently mm -hmm. and a lot of other cities are able to pay more because of various things they didn't lose as much money and they got more money from the federal government so uh you know, I guess my number one thing would be if we're going to bring back positions, how are we going to pay for those positions? How are we going to pay for infrastructure? How are we going to pay for our long term liabilities like pension? And how are we going to do it while also not touching NCIP, not touching businesses? I just don't see it. To me, it seems like fantasy. So um, this for me would be a priority, but I guess staff, if if you know, I don't know how you're going to do it. That's that's my thinking. Is I just don't know how we're going to do it. Realistically, I think we should probably be freezing new hires, except for the ones that are going to pay for themselves, like maybe the um, business license uh, per position. Sounds like that could actually generate new revenue. But if I'm being completely logical and kind of rational about it. I don't see how we're gonna be able to provide the salaries we need to provide. Do the actual, you know, everybody says, yeah, we need to be setting away funds for future infrastructure needs. And that PERS liability is not gonna go away and it's not gonna get smaller unless um, we pay it off. So I don't know. I guess I don't. I, I I'm a little bit worried about the idea of bringing back positions if we're not going to make other major structural changes in how we do business in the city. Yeah, and then that gets back to again the point of if we have a structural deficit, we have to look at the structure. And and I, I think would help me uh, at the next meeting is let's see what the financial impact this how much this is going to cost. To bring these positions back that would help me to have the data one of the things again i don't know uh, 
that's too far in the future. But when measure S expires, 20, 20, help me, 2026? 2027. 2027, of course, that's five years out. But at that point, the, the residents of Monterey might, might want to renew that for infrastructure or general sales tax. I, I expect that they would if this council and, and subsequent councils uh, bite the bullet like we say we will, and that will help. That may be one solution, but I, it's still, you, Alan, your point is, is, is right on. What, what are we, how do we get out of the structural deficit? Doing the same old thing doesn't do it. Yep. Council member Dan. So if I can just make a comment on structural deficits, mm -hmm. Stru the structural deficit that we are seeing over five years is based on a projected budget. When you look at the end of the year and all the revenues and the expenditures are counted, you don't have a deficit. So True. you just have to remember structural deficits are on projections, not on, not on actuals. So, mm -hmm. That's what happened this year. We thought we were going to be in deficit and we ended up with three point or $2.3 million worth of, of uh, fallout. So that happens a lot. So the structural deficit, you, the process you need to change is getting your budgets that you develop in July as close as you can to when you close the books in the, the ending year. That's that's the structure that needs to be changed. Mm. Is is to is to do a better job of projecting what your revenues and what your expenditures are going to be at the end of the year. Then you wouldn't have structural deficits. Okay, thank you. That's the voice of experience. Yeah. <laughs> is your hand up again, Ed, or did you not yeah, take it down? Yeah, I just I hadn't made a comment about this this point. So. Yes, I okay. All right, go for real, it. Real quickly, I think it's been um, stated already to echo that the way I would approach this is, uh, and I think the city manager said this in his presentation, if it's revenue neutral, if it's a key position that is uh, providing a service, generating revenue, um, and it's efficient and makes sense, driven towards um, not starting new programs, but also keeping the bottom line of us within our budget, I concur. Uh, I can't argue with any of these, and I can point out a couple of them that are actually going to be revenue neutral or enhanced services that bring the efficiencies into the departments. So I think you know, we'll, we'll get more on this the next time we meet for the budget, uh, but I generally concur with this as long as we're following the the tenets of we're still close on our money and we know we have to be careful and we're not completely out of this uh, this pickle that we we started in because of COVID. All right, Hans, did you have your hand up? Yeah, just very briefly, uh, another aspect that, that um, drives the staffing decisions to a degree as well is that uh, we we have still the same amount of infrastructure. We have a lot less employees, and bringing back some of the employees um, will not boost morale um, significantly, but is absolutely necessary in in certain areas where we do not have backup and where folks cannot even take um, uh, longer vacations because there's no one to backfill positions, and um, so. Part of that is 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 also uh, really necessary to um, help and support our our labor force. Right. Okay. Well. Well. Uh, it's as I said, we could we could spend twenty four hours on this subject, and and I appreciate how insightful everybody is. Hans, uh, again, and Raphael are the ones who are going to take this discussion, public comment, council com, uh, observations, suggestions, and so on, and bring, a, bring it back. Um, is there anything else you need from us tonight? I can't hear you, Hans. Hans, we can't oh, hear you. Thank you so much. Uh, I took my mask off because I'm literally almost alone here uh, in the con in the, in the yeah. all the business folks left after they listened to council and so we were all alone for the past 20 minutes or so uh -huh. 
I just want to share, yes, we got our input. Uh, we will reach out also to NCIP with some very concrete uh, projects. Uh, I, I think that was what I heard also the council would be okay with. Mm -hmm. And um, then we come back uh, in two weeks. Uh, we'll bring you back also the information that was requested by various council members. And uh, hopefully we, we jotted everything down. Thank you very much for, for your patience tonight. I think you brought up a point that we should clarify that any any ask of the oh there's the council chambers any i've been known to clear out council chambers more than once. <laughs> but any ask of the ncip would is not this fiscal year all those projects have already been presented they've been they're voting jan uh, june 16th so we're talking next year so any kind of requests to the ncip of, We've got time to really hone in on, on getting those in front of them for their next round. So I, that was the clarification you made earlier. So your hand's still up, Ed? Are you going to leave that up permanently? It's, no, I just I put it up and I've, I've been in and out of the internet, so I don't know what I've lost or what I heard. I just want to. Hand's always up. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm pointing right at you, Dan. One of the things, <laughs> one of the things that was suggested, and I don't know if it was Hans's question about a council stipend increase. No, yeah. I'm, no, that's that's silly, and I don't know where that came from, and uh, not interested in that at all. Okay. Yeah, I, I would just throw in uh, since you raised that point at, at this time, Ed. I, I don't think it's silly. I think it impacts um, our can't hear you want to become a council member am i frozen again Gosh, yes you're you in and out oh did you hear that part <laughs> you're in the I, dark tyler i yeah, yeah would, would, would you Literally. use your stipend would you use your stipend to pay your electric bill please, yeah, please. <laughs> i was just Go saying ahead, tyler. i was just saying how i i don't think it's silly i think um it's not about paying us currently sitting on the council. It's a, to me, it's a structural issue and a way of recruiting folks that are interested in even wanting to step forward to be on the council when the council in 1999 or whatever the date was thought that the amount that we're getting now was appropriate. How can the council today think that that is appropriate when we're seeing such a, a higher cost of living. This isn't to say that this is how we're, Alan, you know, not retired, still, am I frozen again? Gosh darn it, gosh. Am I frozen? Back. Am I frozen? Am I frozen? Okay. I'm just gonna stop. I, I, I just, I just have, I just, I just was trying to paint a counter narrative on the subject that hopefully we can maybe just talk more about next time because and we can talk about it sometime we can do it off budget and i will give you the history of how i started the stipends and why i did it at the time so i'll give you a little more history on all that i love it all right so without further ado excellent meeting you, you all really helped me grow make me think uh, we'll we'll do some voting uh, if we need a decision tree uh, next next time we can do that as well but i really think the, the uh, thoughts that we shared with the staff i think were really valuable in helping that's our job and we let them do the work so thanks everybody uh, outstanding meeting good night